so, uh, introduction to Ember.js. And we're off to a big start already. Stop it. All right. What is Ember.js? Uh, besides awesome, as Matt already talked about. So, <clears throat> I classify Ember.js as being what I've uh, coined as being the next generation of frameworks, of which I think there's only three. There's Backbone, Angular, and Ember. And of those three, as Matt already alluded to, I think Ember is above the other two by far. Um, you can do in Ember, or excuse me, in Angular and Backbone, you can write JavaScript applications, single page applications, and you can accomplish the same thing like you can in Ember. But as Matt was alluding to, Ember gives it to you out of the box, whereas, and it, it's a working solution out of the box, whereas with Angular and Backbone, it's you can have something that works, but you're left a little bit more to yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially if that's the flexibility that you need, uh, which leads into this next part, which is, uh, I'll actually skip the third bullet point. Ember is very opinionated. Um, in order to get it out of the box and have it working, you have to do things their way. You have to uh, agree with their concepts. You have to understand their naming conventions. You have to uh, understand what they're expecting out of your application and how they want you to work with it. And if you're in alignment with all of those, then you're going to love it and have no problems. And you can stand an app up very quickly, and you're, it's awesome. If you don't agree with any of those for whatever reason, or you're in a situation where you can't agree with those for, again, whatever situation, then Angular Backbone is certainly something that will you know, help you get the job done as well. But of the three, I certainly would recommend Ember. But again, I consider all of these to be considered like the next generation framework. Like I said earlier, I came from Dojo. And I was using Dojo, and I was using Dojo over jQuery or, or uh, Prototype or any of these other ones because it was more of a toolkit to let you build applications. But it was for a different time. It was not, you could make a single page app happen, but you had to wire up the back end. You had to manage user state. You had to manage bindings. And they had some things that could help you with that, but they didn't have the concept of routers, and they didn't have controllers. I mean, they sort of did. Like, everything they had was sort of, kind of. And I just kept fighting it and fighting it and fighting it. And I was like, all right, this is ridiculous. I can either burn more time trying to figure out how to make Dojo do what I want to do, or it's time for me to reevaluate what's out in the marketplace. And I looked at Angular, looked at Backbone, and looked at Ember. And I was like, no, oh, this isn't even discussion moved with Ember. Uh, I've been using it since the 0.4 alpha days. It's almost two years ago when you were insane to use it. Um, <laughs> and I've been riding the Ember wave ever since. It is so much more stable now. Um, it's at uh, what 1.61, I think is the actual stable release at the moment. We're running beta 1.7, well, we're running 1.71, we upgrade to 1.74, because we want the career parameters and the capabilities inside of it. But uh, we rolled those in way back when, uh, even though uh, they weren't in there yet, because we needed them. Uh, so anyway, so Ember is a framework for creating ambitious web applications. It will let you build an application. Uh, it will take care of event binding for you, uh, page management, resource management, models, uh, all kinds of things. We're going to see all those things. But it's not to say, I've got a web page. Oh, hey, I need to go make a little AJAX call and show some data, or I need to update this color when so many mouse is over. That's what you use jQuery for, or just raw JavaScript, or anything else. This is to build an actual application. It's akin to building a desktop application in any like the Windows libraries. If you're using like, uh, and I'm going to date myself, it's been a while, like the Windows uh, presentation framework and that kind of stuff, which I'm sure has been in place. Um, but the idea is that you're building an actual full-fledged application with a lot of user state and long run. That's what Ember can get you out of the box. Built for productivity, again, opinionated. So we're going to go over what those opinions are. If you, if you don't agree with them and there's nothing wrong with that, you're going to have a harder going in Ember than if you do agree with them. So I'm not saying you have to drink the Kool-Aid, but the Kool-Aid Kool -Aid tastes great. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it is sometimes perceived as difficult to learn, partly because of the opinionation, and partly because it is just a little bit difficult to learn. So this is your, you know, your average learning curve for anything. In this case, it could be backbone, it could be angular, it's not drawn to scale. Uh, but the idea is that, hey, I can just get something off the bottom, out of the go, this is my hello world, I start, I'm going, oh, i got to do something else, great, i, I learn a little bit more, i got to do something else, i learn a little bit more, you know, that kind of thing. This is Ember's learning curve. Holy cow, what did I just do? I finally understand it, and that's it. Once you've understood their opinions, and you understand the concepts, which we're going to talk about here in a few moments, once you hit this point, again, not draw the scale, but once you hit this point, <laughs> That's it. There's no more learning. The same pattern that works for Ember's Hello World works for a ridiculously large application. There's one set of patterns. That's how you do it. So again, a little bit of you know, got to take that in uh, in context. Really. And how much of whatever you said you, this, this naming 
actually gets rolled out that way for deployment? As far as like naming conventions? Um, all of it. Like so, and we're going to get into it more, but uh, instead of having a file that might have a function in it, the and then you say, oh, well, this is the name of my function, and now I'm somehow going to expose that to the rest of my code. Either I'm going to export it as like an AMD module, or, or I'm going to include this file somehow and get access to it. I'm throwing up the global namespace. Uh, it very much says, well, name a file this and put it in a folder called routes. Now that's your router called that. So it's very, it expects things to be called something in a certain location. But it makes sense, and again, you'll see it, uh, because it, it's, it's just well organized. Um, where I find that most people's argument is against this isn't that they don't want opinions or they don't want structure. They just don't want this structure. Well, why do they call it that? It should have had an S on the end. Why is it capital? Well, I don't know about views. Maybe it should be called view layer. It's like, if, if really, if, if what we're discussing is the name of the folder, but you bind everything else, just Deal with it for a little bit. See how you like it. And I guarantee you, you're going to forget what it's called because you're not going to be messing with it anymore because you're writing your, an application. You're dealing with this and not the underlying stuff that you normally have to do if you're, if you're trying to write an equivalent application in jQuery. You can do it in jQuery. I mean, this is obviously raw JavaScript, but you're having to wire up a bunch of things and create event managers and observers and all these patterns that come out of the box. So. Those do go out the door like that. But what ends up happening, we'll talk about it in a compilation step, is it's not, the names don't matter at that point because of how they get registered. And so we'll look at that. All right, so there's several core concepts in Ember that if you understand them, make your development life so much more simple. These concepts are not limited to, but these are the primary ones. Models, routes, templates, views, controllers, and components. Most of these should sound familiar if you've had any experience with an MVC framework, model view controller, whether it be on the server side or client, uh, Angular, Backbone, you know, again, same concepts. Um, we're going to go through and talk about each of these. A few of these words have slightly different meanings in the Ember ecosystem than you might expect them to. Uh, so again, it's, it's making that connection between what Ember means by it and what it's really doing. And once you make that connection, it makes you know, everything easier, etc. So we're just going to go through these. All right, so a model is just an object that stores persistent state. Excuse me. So the idea here is that if you want to be able to take data that's in your application and store it off somewhere, or you have data that is stored off somewhere and you want to use it in your application, it is represented through an object referred to as a model. It's just a JavaScript object, but the concept is a model. We're going to talk about templates a little bit later, but how you get that data in the model out to the user to see is through templates. Because templates are responsible for displaying that data. And the templates is where your HTML is, and we're going to get to templates in a moment. In many of your Ember applications, models are just going to be loaded by, via an HTTP JSON API. However, you can give Ember its data to its models any way you want. It's just JavaScript. So this is the normal way. There's a bunch of different ways. Uh, the live coding demo we're going to look at, we use just raw JavaScript and arrays to populate our models because, again, they're just objects. Uh, there is a library uh, out there called Ember Data. It's a companion library to the Ember framework. You do not have to use Ember Data to use uh, Ember. Uh, a lot of people do. It gives you an out-of-the-box persistency, if that's even a word, but I'm going with it, between your JavaScript uh, object models and back-end persistent storage. They also have an adapter for local storage, etc. Uh, there's other uh, data pro uh, uh, projects out there. There's Ember Model, there's Ember RESTful, Ember REST, I forget what it's called. There's uh, yeah. Yeah, e e PF. We wrote our own because nothing quite did what we wanted for our own use, so we wrote our own. It's called, uh, conveniently enough, SL Model for software. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does everything we needed to do. Uh, the point being, you don't have to worry about any of those. You truly can just do straight up this. And tonight's demo, we're not even doing JSON calls. All right, uh, uh, HTTP calls. We're doing it just right there in the models. All right, routes. So inside of an Ember application, routes are the URL representations of your application's objects. And it tells the template which model to display. So in this example, if you had a cars URL, it tells it to render a collection of cars. It can get more complicated than that. This is what it does right out of the box for you. It queries the model, makes it available in the controllers and the templates. So the router is saying, what's the state of my application? 
I'm going to go get the data that goes with that. I'm going to go tell the templates that go with that to display it to the user. And then as the templates or models being shown to the users change, the URL is automatically kept up to date. So there's a two-way relationship with the URL. Initially, when you put in a URL, you can load the Ember application into a specific state based off the URL saying, I want these, uh, these models, meaning I want this data, I want these templates. But then, once that's going on, if you have other actions going on, you hit a button and you, you move somewhere else, you're then telling the application to change state. When it changes state, the last thing it does after it does all of its rendering is say, what state is my application in? Represent that as a URL and put that in the browser. So you can start with that and have the state represent where you started with the URL, or you can change your application state and have the URL be a representative of that. That's important to remember uh, as you're loading models and moving back and forth, but there's also something you can do with an Ember application. We're going to do it as a full, uh, it's a single page app. It is, like when you go to the URL, it is the application. But it is possible to load an Ember application into just a div on a page. So you could be on a normal website and then load an Ember application, and you could load another Ember app and another Ember app. Well, none of those are going out to the URL. They still have this concept inside, because the router is keeping track of internal objects that are on the application state. But it's not going to represent itself out to the address bar if that's how you're loading it. So um, again, you, the URL, even though that's what you type in to get to a web page, that's what, you, that's what we've been training the last 20 years of web use, and that is still correct. You can initialize your application state at a URL. Think of it more like this. The URL is just visual eye candy to represent the state of the application. The URL is not necessary for your application to work correctly. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right. Um, well, we pretty much already uh, hit on that. It's because you can load the, the individual state, you can give the URL to your application. And they would know, oh, I want to load uh, you know, these posts, these comments for this user, you know, whatever you have in the URL, and it can immediately take your application into the correct state. So a lot of single page apps that you saw you know, several years ago when, the, when that concept was still going on, you can get navigated in somewhere and be like, this is awesome. And you send that link to your buddy, and they just load up that first page of the application. And they're like, well, that's kind of blows. What did you send me? You're like, no, 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 you're not seeing this. It's like, you've got to click here and then here and there and then this. And they're like, yeah, I'm over that. This takes you right to that uh, application initialization. All right, along with the routes, you can set properties in your controllers, which we're going to talk about what those are. You can execute events and actions. You can connect a particular template to a particular controller. So remember when I said uh, you uh, went to slash card, it's going to load a collection of cards. That's the easy way out of the box. You could also say when I load, like let's say, dashboard, you could actually say on this dashboard, I want to load this template with this data, and I want to load that template with this data, and that template with this data. So there's one URL concept, but it's doing multiple template and data things. Um, you can do that as well. That's, that's you do all this in the routes. All right, so the template. This is the HTML of your application. This is what you normally are used to writing you know, as you're doing web applications. Uh, this is what the user sees and interacts with. Each template's going to be backed by a model. Um, it gets its data from the controller. And if the model ever changes, the template will automatically change as well. Out of the box. Again, you break that. But out of the box, if we're showing a list of users, and we go add a new user to the user model, or add a new user add a new user model to the collection of users, to be very specific, then the list of users would automatically just have one added. There's automatic live binding going on out of the box, which we're going to see examples of and talk about. That's accomplished using the handlebars templating language. So again, this goes back to that opinion. It is possible to use Ember without handlebars. Don't Unless you have a lot of free time or you have a very specific business reason you have to do that, don't. Because you're just going to have to recreate a lot of things. But it goes back to that opinion. A lot of people are like, oh, I just don't like handlebars as a template engine. All right. It's possible to use Ember without it. But out of the box, you get all these things without having to do any extra work. You can include other templates. Uh, you can do if-else logic, um, you know, with, without, all those types of things. You can do loops. You can do formatting helpers on your data. Uh, your expressions, this is how you get your data out of your templates. So you can say, I want the first name off my model. Show it here. Uh, those little uh, airplane brackets on each side, that's just handlebar syntax. These are just JavaScript files, or I take it back. They're, uh, they're text files with a handlebars extension, and they can process via JavaScript. Um, outlets are where you can tell uh, other data to be rendered. So when we're talking about that dashboard, you could have, uh, you know, this is my uh, user's outlet, this is my, uh, you know, I don't 
a stats outlet and something else, you can tell your data to render into these outlets uh, on the page. Uh, the same concept is like a yield or um, I'm trying to think of another one from another library, but you get the concept there. Uh, you can also do components inside of your templates, which we're going to touch on a little bit as well. Um, they let you uh, create reusable uh, functionality that you just drop in into your application. And when we get to components, I'll touch on a key point, and you got to keep in mind on this one too, because they blur the lines a little bit in the definition. Are outlets then something that would, <clears throat> that would be really common anytime you have anything that's very complex, that that's how you, you break things up? Is it a common decomposition method? Or it, it, it can be. There's like two ways to do it. They, like, you can have an app. You can have an entire application that just has one outlet, okay. and that everything gets rendered into that same outlet. But usually, I mean, like if you have a sidebar that is always displaying <coughs> something, and then like the rest of your application is kind of updating, you might have two outlets: one for the sidebar and one for your main application. Right there. Gotcha. Well, another thing too that outlets are used for is if you've got a route that's that's nested or that's got separate um, yeah. like pads on the end. The outlet is how you basically say like. Um, Trying to think of, think of an example, but um, the outlet is also where any of those. So if you have a route that has multiple segments to it, it's going to start at the first one. It's going to render any page you have for that one, and if it's got an outlet, that's where it's going to then re render the next segment. It's going to go into that outlet and render it there. So, and so it's like so we say like cars for, you know, or we say for trucks F one fifty, and as as what Josh was talking about, as those go, it would just say oh. I've got, this one goes into that outlet. Now that I'm here, oh, I've got more stuff. If that has an outlet, that's where that's Yeah, you have a Ford page that says, here's an outlet where whatever the specific model gets rendered, but this page is just where the, the maker and all of that yeah, content that's is. So out of the box, the way Ember expects you to organize your application, just out of the box, is exactly what Josh was talking about with that nesting. So the idea is that if I keep navigating, you know, like, oh, man, I just clicked on this, and I want to see that, and I click on it, and I click on it, but I still want to see the other data. And the URL is just getting longer. See previous choices. Yeah, exactly. And it's all there. And that's perfectly fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't work for every application. Right. At which point, then what Matt was talking about, like in the application we've written, uh, we have two outlets, maybe? And I think a yield somewhere in a component. Like, we don't use them because we don't, our data doesn't organize that way. Right. We have a, uh, a dashboard. And it's very particular what you're doing in that dashboard. You're either on an overview or you're on the tickets or you're on the devices or you're on this thing. We don't have nested hierarchy in the way that Ember gives you out of the box. Gotcha. So we just we change our routes and instead we say, hey, controller, you've got this data, you've got that data, you've got that data, render these templates. We do a lot of it in the route and not through the nested route out of the box. Nice. Do outlets share the same route and or controller or is do they have their own unique uh, corresponding one? Out of the box, they have their own okay. if you follow the nested hierarchy, because okay. each nest would have its own level of control. Um, okay. But that's easily changed, like very okay. easily. Like You might change it and not even realize you changed it. It's so easy to change it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. I don't know if you have, yeah. Can we keep uh, templates in separate files? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to go over over that. But yes, absolutely. I recommend you do that, but it takes an extra step, which isn't really a big deal, but it depends on your background, depends on your environment, that kind of thing. But we're going to look at both ways. Cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, so views. So, um, well, we'll go through this, and I'll, I'll, I'll free associate as I go. Uh, so they represent the visual parts of your application that the user can see in the browser. Sounds very much like a template, but it's not. You do not have to have a view. Ember is all about the models, the templates, and a route. Views are ancillary. So you do not have to have a view. Anything you don't uh, specify, which we're going to look at, gets created for you behind the scenes. So every route is going to have a controller and a view uh, and a template. But if you didn't specifically define one, it gives you a, it gives you a default one because that's how it, it needs to work, so it creates one. So if you want to define one, you can, but it's not required. Um, these can handle events or custom interactions that are impossible to manage with the templates. Did insert element as a hook. So basically, if you need more functionality in your template, you start creating a view and putting it here. So now you can uh, react to uh, click events, key press events. You can create custom elements. You can put custom logic in here. Um, 
there is a did insert element hook. So that way you can say, now that that element has been inserted into the DOM, I now have reference to it. So now I can run jQuery code against that actual element reference in case I want to do a focus on it or I want to do you know, something else. There's also will insert element, which says I've rendered it all. Uh, I, uh, I've prepared all the, the, uh, the node tree, but I have not inserted it into the DOM yet. Now is your chance to make changes to it without it jumping around on the screen to the user and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's also a uh, will uh, will destroy element. I use that so infrequently. Um, in case you want to tear something down, like you had an event listener running that was outside of the Ember ecosystem, or you wanted to learn something else, or whatever. So the point is, you don't need a view, but if you want to start doing more things than just simple display logic that your template's capable of, the view is where you do all that. And then there's a relationship between the uh, template and the controller and the wrap that knows how to run. Um, and then, so this is very important, when you start wanting to create reusable uh, code, be careful because components are different, when you want to start reusing code, uh, you can start putting them in here, uh, such as the modals or you want to react to different things, that kind of stuff. So that's what a view is. All right, controllers. We have several slides about controllers because they are very important. All right, these are objects that store application state. So remember, models were objects that store data usually to be persistent somewhere. Controllers are objects that store application state. The route is going to set a model on that. Again, remember, this is out of the box. You can change this. There are cases where you want to change this. But out of the box, this is how Ember just works conceptually. It's going to act as a bridge between your model and the viewer of the template. Um, when your template says, you know, airplane bracket, airplane bracket, first name, it's first going to look at the controller to see if there's a property there called first name, and then it's going to go on to the model. So even though we said before a template gets its data from the model, which is true, it is possible for the controller to intercept that. It can change it. If you define something here, it's never going to go to the model. Likewise, you can add new properties on the controller and access them from the template, and it won't go to the model either. And we'll see examples of those when we do the live code. If you don't tell it, what type you want or that you want one at all, you still get one for free. It's part of the Ember magic. There's always a controller, there's always a view, there's always a template. You have to have a template unless you specifically tell it it's a different way. Uh, but views and controllers do not have to create. So the point is, on disk, you don't have to have a bunch of empty files if you don't have anything extra you want to declare. Uh, components. So these are views. But they're completely isolated. So if you have, uh, we're talking before in the uh, template where if I wanted to capture the click event, I wanted to bubble up to the view and I'm going to do something on it. In a component, when you capture the click event, it's not leaving that component. It's not going to go to the view that holds it on that page. It's completely self-contained. Um, great way to build reusable components for your applications. OK. So Ember's opinionated. Has anybody heard or followed the concept of web components in browsers? Not just Ember, but browsers, W3C, web components. All right, so the idea behind web components in the browser is that I should be able to create a custom tag. I should be able to call it soft layer calendar and describe the uh, HTML that goes with it, the CSS that goes with it, and the JavaScript that goes with it. So when I serve that from my uh, server in a web page, and the user's browser sees that tag, it says, oh, I have all the things that go along with how to make this tag, and I can create a new component for the user. And it's isolated. So my CSS and my JavaScript are not going to bleed out and affect anything else on the page, and nobody else's JavaScript or CSS is going to bleed in and affect my component as well. Now, there are ways to make them talk. You have to go, you know, you have to do that yourself. But that's the idea. I should be able to create a custom tag that I drop on my HTML, give the browser instructions on how to render it, and voila, all this magic happens. Those are web components. So Ember took that same idea, put them in here, called them components, don't let them talk to the application, but you really want them to a lot of times. So we pretty much view components as their widgets that are limited because they can't talk to the rest of the ecosystem, but they're not components because they have nothing to do with custom tags. They've kind of mixed these concepts together. 
Part of that, I suspect, is because you do the CATS is on the same W3C advisory board that's making the web components spec. So, I, kudos. I mean, powerful. You just have to understand the limitation. Mentally, for a while, I thought of these as reusable widgets. That's how you use them. But they're too isolated to be used that way. They act more like web components. But in a member application, a web component's kind of useless. Will you have an example? We can, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have one specifically, but it's very easy to do. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, again, it's just talking about concept, just keeping that in mind. Because uh, that has been us several times. Uh, it's just, it, it, most solutions are 90% of what you want. And, and we're just like, there's a piece missing. All right, so uh, you might have seen in Josh's uh, that long introduction thing. I uh, appropriated it for myself, appropriate attribution. So this is a diagram that kind of describes what we just talked about uh, from the concepts. So you've got the route that's going to load your model. It's also then going to set that model on your controller. Your controller sets your state on your view and your templates, which renders. And that's kind of the, uh, the related circle, uh, or a triangle, or whatever shape that is, uh, between all of these concepts. Any questions about any of that? Which we have is, more, but is, any questions? Which no. is true universally, right? Does it, this is not an Ember-specific thing. This is universally, is that? <sighs> you know, does that if it's MVC, okay. yes. I mean, that's the theory behind it, yes. Angular this is a very is common close. pattern. It's not exactly. Angular's close, but it's but not Exactly. Close. It, it's, you've got to put air quotes around MVC. Coach. It's MV dat, MV star, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, with a, with, with a little bit of Ember at the end. Cool. Yeah. Because you, you'll find as you're writing an application, we'll see this more later, you'll end up putting a lot of your logic here and not here. Routers act more like controllers in your typical MVC than they do a router. But then again, Routers are kind of a new concept in MVC. Like they're, they're ambiguous depending on which framework you're using. Um, it, let's say I'm PHP, so I can, you know, off the top of my head, in like Zen framework, there's a front controller that acts like your router, but it's a controller by name, but it truly has router things it does versus gotcha. MV dash with air quotes around it. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, you'll find that a lot of your business, this uh, decorates your data. This controls your application. Which is the opposite from Angular, yes. where the route just sends you to your controllers, which do all your work for you. So, so it's an important That's distinction fun. to know, especially if you're coming from one or the other, or you have a traditional MVC. Again, what's traditional? But if you have a traditional MVC description in your mind, because uh, when I first started, like I said two years ago, I mean, they didn't even have a router when I started. So everything was in here. And now you really are very route heavy and controller lighter. Which makes perfect sense, but making that mental shift, you're just, like, you're just constantly running into it until it makes sense. The learning curve is like this, and then flat. Could, could you give a simple example of what would you do in a router versus a controller? Uh, well, this is going to set your application state. So if you go to a dashboard route, you might look up the model. And you're going to set data on this controller and set it on that controller and set data on this controller. And then you're going to say, okay, now I'm on my dashboard. If a user clicks anywhere, I want all those click events to go up to this route and I'm going to react to it. Instead of saying, I want to handle them here or here, um, you want a lot of things end up at your, at your route. Uh, anything that's shared across your application, um, you're going to, anything that's universal action, logging out, those types of things, like they belong to your application not your controller. The controller says, I'm going to take my, I have a request for, to display a property. I'm going to proxy that out to my model. Because it's going through me, if I want to change it, I can. If I want to change state, or maintain state, because again, these are applications, or these are the state of your data, of your, of your application on a case-by-case -case basis. If I have something here where I'm toggling saying, hide this, show this, hide this, show this, well, I would put that here, the hide, show, hide, show, because it doesn't belong in the model. That belongs you know, on your view or your controller, uh, predominantly in your controller, to try to share it out to other controllers. If it truly is just view, 100% view, and it doesn't need to be shared with any other template, then you can put it here. 
a good rule of thumb is always put things at the lowest place that they need to be shared. So if templates don't ever need to share anything with their other templates or views, because these are kind of you know mushed together, then you can put it here. But if you want a if you want a user controller that's showing a user list, that when I toggle something, it turns on or off an availability controller and its data. Well, now I'm going to put it on the controller because this controller can talk to the other controller, but the entire application doesn't. Need it. So we'll see it more in the live code demo. All right, so a few more slides about controllers because they are so important uh, in, in Ember conceptually. All right, they decorate your models with display logic. It's really, you know, that's their job. They also hold on the application state, like we talked about before. Um, so your models, uh, again, typically have data on them, properties that are persistent somewhere to, let's like, say, a server, whereas your controller is going to hold on to properties that are important to the way your application is running, but they don't get persistent. So again, they're toggling a state. Is this happening? Is this, you know, is this not happening? Uh, the user wanted to filter or show this, or they wanted to collapse something. And again, those lines, as I was just describing, that can get a little bit blurred between the view. It, it works better with a code example, which we have. Um, and then we already talked about this. When a template references a property, if it's on the controller, it, it never goes to the model. And if it's not on the controller, then it'll go onto the model. That's out of the box. You can change that. You can get fancy. You can say, oh, I know I've got one, but I want to check something else first. Oh, I don't already have this thing. Now we'll give it off the model and return it to the user. I mean, it's easy enough to do an if, else, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, but it's going to check here first. Um, when we say properties, the properties could also be functions. Uh, they, they work uh, interchangeably inside of that for very easily. It, how it works out of the box. And again, we'll show examples. All right, so there's three different types of controllers. If you just have a controller, then it's just a value store. So maybe you're storing uh, authentication state on the user, or you're storing some sort of, they have this hidden and they have this shell. Uh, you truly can just, you have a controller and it just stores values and properties. That's, that's the concept behind it. It doesn't do much. Again, it's as powerful as you build it, but just out of the box, uh, it's just a value store. An object controller is going to represent a single model. So this would say that I have a, a user object, or excuse me, a user controller that's representing a user model, because I only have one user logged into the model, in the example I'm describing at the moment. Uh, whereas an array controller is going to represent an array of models. So I could have a cars array controller, and it's going to have multiple car models as its content. So uh, three different types of controllers. If you don't specifically define a controller, uh, the number is going to automatically create one for you. And it's going to look at the data that came back from its model hook in the route. And then it's going to decide what kind of controller you're going to get. So if it returns an object, you're going to get an object controller. If it returns an array, then you're going to get an array controller. And if it doesn't return anything, then you get Ember controller. So remember, if you don't have a need to specifically create a controller, because you're not adding any additional logic, one still gets created for you. And in the case of controllers, a decision is made as to which one, because there's three different types. A view's a view, there, there's no other type of view. Controllers, there's three. So in that case, when your if you don't create a controller, you get it from the model and creates a controller for you. Since the, the Ember's going to check the controller first for that data, is it not going to go back to the model again since it's already created it on this? No, it'll go to the model. So what will happen, because it's a single page app, so the very first time that that route's hit, it's going to do, assuming this is how you have it set up, the route's going to go make the request to your, to get your models, it comes back, and it's going to say, am I a single object, am I an array of objects? I'm going to be either an object controller or an array controller. And that's what it creates. So then, uh, when the template looks for its data, it'll pass through that controller, and in this case, there'll never be anything set. Because okay, so it's not it's already created. Just been created in exactly, control. so it's just going to always proxy through it. Gotcha. And then yeah. it'll set the, uh, the controller will have a model property. Correct. That's set with, uh, now, if you wanted to go and add a function or a property to this controller, you're, you're going to have to go create it on disk. This is an in-memory creation. It's not like during build time where it says, oh, I've got all these uh, routes that don't have ex explicit model files created. I'm going to create these files. These are in-memory, in or at execution time creation. Because, again, how Ember needs to hook things together, because it needs to have somewhere for the model to be proxied to through a controller. So it creates all these in-memory. So 
you know, you've had the application up and running for five weeks, you know, you got a new feature you need to go add, you're like, oh, I know this needs to go on my car controller. Oh, I don't have a car controller. I need to go create one. Make sure when you create it, you make it an array controller or an object controller, because if you create the wrong type, then your app's not gonna work and you wonder why. Well, because Ember was automatically creating the right type for you, and you just told me something different. Uh, but we can see in the console, you can log all those active transitions, so you can see all the stuff it's creating for you. Uh, but again, that's not anything during like a build process, that's an in-app creation at runtime. All right, so there's some naming conventions. This goes back to Ember being opinionated. Um, so this is what's gonna happen when your application boots. If you go load Ember, and you say, uh, Ember, I don't remember how it started, it's been so long, application dot, create, or something like that. You'll see why. I use tooling that just does it for me. It's been forever. But the point is, it's going to look for this file, this file, and this file. How does the application boot? Someone enters it in a URL? Uh, yes, when you go to a web page that contains an Ember application, you're going to include a reference to your source code, which should be a combination either in the same file or separate files, however you want to organize it. It's going to be the Ember library, most likely the jQuery library, uh, although that dependency is being removed in soon to come, soon to come version, as well as your application code. So it's just like jQuery, like I need jQuery, and then here's the code that I wrote in jQuery. I need Ember, and I need my application that's written in it. So you're gonna pull those files in on your, on your web page, and then you, and I'll get you the exact syntax, because I don't wanna screw it up, but there's like an app.create something. I just a little bit of JavaScript. Yeah, it's like one line that fires up your application and starts the entire Ember application process. At which point it looks for these things, which you get out of the box. Like the hello world comes with this. Okay, so let's back up. Sure. So the user isn't booting the application. The developer is booting the application. Well, the the user by requesting a web page gets HTML. That HTML contains JavaScript that has a line of code that says start up the Ember application. So the user doesn't have to do anything. They just have to go to the web page. So as a developer, if you don't put that startup line in your JavaScript code, it's not going to start. But there's nothing the user has to do other than just come visit you. Yeah. <coughs> if you, uh, so that's if you just hit the main, you know, slash URL of your Ember application. If you go to slash favorites, then it's going to look for the favorites drop, the favorites controller, and the favorites template. So remember how we got those auto-created controllers and the views and stuff for you? And I said views weren't needed, like they don't get auto-created unless, well, that's a corner case. Um, this is the naming convention. There's a route called favorites route. There's a controller called favorites controller. Now this could be an array controller or an object controller. Again, it depends. Uh, and you're gonna have a favorites template out of the box. So these, again, there's some naming conventions that they want you to follow. You can change them if you need to, but I stress only if you need to. Why incur additional headache? It is not worth it just to have a different name. If there's a legitimate need, by all means, but it's just drink the Kool-Aid, be happy, move on. So is it not obvious where all the places you have to touch to get it right? Is that the peril? No, it's just... I get that you shouldn't fight it. I'm saying is it error prone when you do fight it? I would say it's error prone you do fight it because there's an awful lot of magic going on. Gotcha. There's a lot of magic going on in that room. Now, I mean, you go read the source code, so magic's on, you know, again, error prone. Um, but out of the box, there's so much happening gotcha. that you can go change one little thing, and there's nine other things that need to be changed in concert. And as soon as that one breaks, you'll be like, now this error doesn't really make any sense. And then, like, unless you actually understand a big picture of it, I, I wouldn't say the first thing you should do, well, you shouldn't first download it and then go, I'm gonna go change. <laughs> Get comfortable first. <laughs> you can change it, but you're just asking for so right. much trouble. Right. Uh, because it does so much automatic generation of stuff for you. Like um, getters and setters, things that are going on and, and the way it handles namespaces inside, and resolutions. And it has its own dependency generation container that it registers names on. Now granted, it's derived from what you called it, but it expects things to be in a certain pattern. And if you break that pattern, yeah. it doesn't know what to do. So for the last line, does it really read a template name favorites? Yes. Favorites that uh, Or or a template with a data name of favorites inside your actual JavaScript. 
I'll show examples of both. But yes, there is a template called favorites. There's several, there's two different ways that you can create that template and store that template, but there is a template called favorites. All right, how do you organize your Ember application? Out of the box, uh, when you pull it out, you are going to write your Ember application something like this. And this is what the Ember website talks about. This is the painful way, but we're going to go through it first. All right, so we've got our, uh, you know, we've got HTML, we've got body, I haven't had so much room. We've got our head. We're going to require our JavaScript library. This is where we pull in Ember. This is where we're going to pull in jQuery. This is where we're going to pull in handlebars. We're going to pull in, you know, whatever the Ember application needs and anything else your entire application needs. Maybe you need the moment library. Maybe you need, you know, D3 charting, whatever. All right, so we pull all that in, right? All right, so here's my JavaScript up here. This is my Ember application. Ah, there's the line. That's how you start your Ember your, uh, application. I knew it was simple. All right, so we're going to create an Ember application. Then I'm going to create my routes. So I've got my dashboard route. And then uh, and I'm registering that route with my router. Then I'm going to define my dashboard route. And then I'm going to define my controller. And then I'm going to continue and continue and continue and continue. I'm going to create all my controllers. I'm going to put all my views. I'm going to put my models. This is my Ember application right here. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. Where do my templates go? Well, I've got a single file, right? That's my application. I put my templates down here. Here's my script. I tell it it's a, uh, well, let me back up. So this is my handlebars. This is by default the application. This is the outlet. This is where your app is going to render itself. It has no name because the default name is application. For subsequent uh, templates, I'm going to name it. This is where it would say favorites or dashboard, and I would create all of my templates down here. Who wants to work at this? Get out. <laughs> <laughs> I just wait for something, right? All right, so that's a single file. When you read the Ember website, they show snippets of code like, just put this, put that. They show little pieces. They don't ever show one of these gigantic files, but they never explain how to not do it this way. <laughs> You're going to want to not do it this way. <laughs> so the other way that you can uh, organize your application is to do multiple files and directories, which seems kind of sane. So in this particular case, we have a folder of controllers. You can ignore the git keeps that comes from the Ember CLI tool. I just screen capture my project. So I've got an application controller, a cart controller, a products controller. Um, we didn't really talk about helpers yet, but we have a currency helper. I've got a products model. There's my routes. Here's some of my, comp well, I didn't expand components. Uh, it's, uh, these are my templates. So I've got my application template, my cart template, my product template, et cetera. Some sanity to the organization. Does I, the user get all of this when he? In this process, they end up with a single file that gets minified. So this is sanity for a developer. But to do this, it requires you to build your Ember application. Because Ember out of the box expects it to work um, like this. This will work. And to get started, do hello world, there's nothing wrong with this. But this works. You do not want to build a gigantic application with 20 developers and you know, 500 active tickets. You, you will, I don't care how great Ember is, you'll kill yourself. So is there a command that goes from the files to the one line? So for this, so that right there, it requires you to build it into a single application file. There's a bunch of different ways you can do it, uh, but basically you're going to use some build tools in the JavaScript world. You can use Brunch, Mimosa, Grunt, Broccoli, you can roll your own. Um, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you use Ember CLI. So Ember CLI takes all of these different concepts and rolls them together into a tool that you can use to manage your application. And that's what I'm going to use tonight, so as you're seeing me do it. Uh, keep in mind that the Ember code I'm writing could just as easily be in that single file, but I'm using a tool set to help me uh, more rapidly develop. It allows me to, from the command line, I can generate these files, and it automatically puts it into this folder structure based off of a predetermined hierarchy. It also then, uh, as part of that tooling of Ember CLI, it also gives me a server that it can serve off of through a proxy so I can see my development work and I have to put it somewhere on a live web server. 
Uh, I can also get, uh, Josh talked about it earlier in the news, but the broccoli build tool is also used in there, and it's what goes through and builds all your source code. So it'll go through and say, okay, I'm gonna go look at all of your templates, and I'm going to take all of those. It can run what's called a uh, pre-compiler on, the, uh, on them, so that way um, it's faster for execution when it gets to the user. Otherwise, once it gets to the user, they're gonna have to do the compilation, so that way they can reference. That's a handlebar step. Uh, we use uh, SAS, or less. We're switching from SAS, my apologies. Uh, anyway, so all of our styles that are in that styles folder, they're less files. As part of our broccoli build process, it says look at that uh, style folder, grab all my less, run it through a less precompiler. Now that I've got that output, what do you do next? Oh, that goes into the styles folder in my dist folder. Um, there's a bunch of other things. Like there's just, it bundles all that stuff together for you. Again, you can use any of these tools, but the Ember community, is predominantly organizing behind the Ember CLI tool. And these tools can be used to go the other way. To reverse Take engineer that application file and then split it out with these nice little files. Uh, I haven't seen anything. I mean, anything's possible. So but that's not how it's just uh, Don't you lose your project source? Like, oh, correct. Well, yeah. I, yeah. I, I would say if you use any of these, you should be using Git. So you don't use your project source. It generates an output, so it doesn't, you know, it's uh, it's just like building any compile time thing. You've got your source and you run your build and it drops out a single file and, and puts right. it in public and right. stuff. But you come in, the, the, the application team has been let go. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, we made a mistake. You get hired. Mm -hmm. You get to see, you can production files, but you don't have No, you have the source. Yeah, yeah you, right. better, you better hope there's source, or I'm going to walk out. Building, <laughs> building it by itself, even if, you, even if you're crazy enough to go without source control, building it itself is non-destructive to your source code. It, it's got a specific directory, it bundles everything up, up wraps it in that single file format you just talking about, yeah. and drops it into a good place. And you can even set it up to where you tell it, like, if you're running a... I understand, but in my hypothetical this, oh. this has been yeah, you're, you're correct. production. And the source code has been lost. The team were yeah. let go. Yeah. Their, their laptops yeah. and yeah. systems were yeah. uh, reacquired and, and cleared. Yeah, because what, what, what happens during this build process? Yeah. You've come in to support the production applications, and all you have is the production deployed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if that was the case, you'd be in trouble. It's no different, it's no different than any other language that has a production build. Like, if you do a production build with any other you can tool. Reverse. Yeah, no. it's possible well, I wouldn't want to, because it takes all these files, concatenates them all together with some other pre-compilation. Like, there's multiple compile steps going on. Puts it all together, then it minifies it. It obfuscates it. So what you get, I mean, you got a lot of time. You can do anything. I would not want to. Like, yeah. yeah, if you don't have a source code, ask for a humongous raise or leave. <laughs> like, I, I just, I would not want to tackle that. Yeah. It would be, hopefully there's really good documentation and you can just recreate the entire application. That would be faster. Yeah, it's because Because everybody's got great documentation, right? It's like 100% documented. <laughs> yeah, right right off the unit test, it create the harnesses for you. Yeah. Another thing with the CLI <laughs> is that it's written and maintained by core team members. Yes, oh, the Ember core team. So if you it's want very to, tight integration. it's a good way to kind of like, if you're following what Ember CLI is doing, you're going to be in step with, with how development of Ember proper is going. If you use other tools, you may have to kind of bend and flex as changes come down the pipeline with Ember, whereas with Ember CLI, you're less likely to run into problems where all of a sudden Ember breaks Ember CLI, because that's kind of, it's almost like if you had to use Rails or something, it's kind of like you can do Rails new, whatever, and it builds that whole, it, it builds that halfway. Scaffolding or something. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's not, yeah, it's, it's uh, so it's kind of like that, and it drops you off, and you've got this whole app, and you can start up your server and go in and look at your website, and you just go in and, you know, it's all the uh, unit test files and stuff for you. Does not write them for you, but it does create the associated and required <laughs> unit tests as well. Um, so that we were like, oh yeah, I guess I should fill that out. <laughs> and it also has the test runner built into it as well, so you just go to like the slash test URL in the dev environment, and there they are, and you just run. And, like, again, it's everything that you would eventually hope to achieve on your own. You could just npm install Ember CLI, Ember new project name, generate a controller, generate a view, generate whatever. You can write custom generators, uh, and we'll get into more of those in other talks, and Matt talked about it a little bit last month as well. If you've used Rails, then 
a lot of a lot of their paradigms and, and the way that they do things. If you've used Rails before, then uh, then you can can kind of see where they're coming from. So there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah. So it's it's kind of accessible to people that if, if they've got a Rails background. Yeah. And most um, most uh, like Angular backbone etc. go through the same type of okay. Okay, process. You can do it not built, but you. You're not going to get very far before you're like, I've got to change this. Does, does the build tool uh, pre-compile the handlebar templates? Too? Yes. The build tool has a plugin that does it. It's a complete tree plugin architecture. So, what yes. about the the YM, uh, the YEL man generator for Ember? Have you guys looked at it on? I have not. I don't know. I know. I know. I had one. I wasn't sure. I didn't know. It's it's pretty old. Is it? Yeah, I mean, like, Ember CLI has its own generators. Does it have, like, a watch uh, folder functionality? Or? Yep. Yeah, it does. Yep. Is that, and does it compile fast? or? Yeah. Yeah. Was, We've got, um, I don't know how many files we have, but ours build is, like, one and a half seconds, I think, is about the average. Yeah. Uh, that's and our build is, that's considered long. Broccoli is the whole thing. They build broccoli to be, to, like, fix the problems with the grind. Well, another thing with it, if you're using Ember CLI, it comes with a built-in node server, and, and they'll tell you it's not a production level node server. But out of the box with Ember CLI, if you do watch it, actually has live reload and everything else. Oh, yeah. So you yes. can make your changes and save it and then go back to your browser and it'll automatically refresh and, and your page will go back nice. to where it was. So but Broccoli does in-memory trees and it does just the differences between the trees, so it's very, very, very fast. It doesn't go to this, and it only does deltas. It's, it's, a, it's a complete re-envision of what the other build tools were doing, but they didn't feel we were doing it correctly. So it's, uh, we've been pretty happy with it. I mean, there was a few rough spots in the very beginning, but I mean, yeah, the very beginning of everything, there's rough spots, so. We use a branch tree for as a build tool, yeah. and then we switched to every CLI a few months ago. So are, are you saying that Ember CLI is an alternative to using Broccoli or any of the Ember CLI uses Broccoli. Oh, okay. Under, under they come. They, okay. yeah, you don't need Ember CLI at all. Uh, gotcha. You could, if you wanted to load up Ember CLI, but you didn't want to use Broccoli for some reason, you could. But it's again, it's okay. back to that whole, it's so tightly integrated because that's yeah. what they just expect you yeah. to do. Um, when we, we initially weren't going to use Ember CLI because at the beginning of it, we weren't sure we wanted some of the stuff it had. So we're like, all right, we'll do brunch. Let's replace brunch with broccoli. Let's try to pull in some of the other things. And if we started growing, started growing, we're just like, well, you know, there's other yeah. things we don't have now that Ember CLI does. Yeah, it's actually kind of cool, and we're maintaining all of this ourselves. And so we just swapped it all out. It didn't take very long to swap it. It was just really getting down to the syntax of like how to manage your trees and say, these are pre-compiled this way, and then pass back out to the larger trees so they can all be flat. Just getting used to that merge tree concept inside yeah. of broccoli. So if you do go, go with Ember CLI, though, it ships with broccoli yeah okay so you wouldn't have to install broccoli separately you correct do that yeah when you uh, you when you do an uh, npm install uh, of ember cli it has a dependency it, it, yeah. well it, it builds it's got a command line generator and okay. you do ember new yeah it's you create a new project is when it does it and it's okay. going to do all of so it's possible let's say six months apart you said ember new you will have a different version of your project like because there's an upgrade to Broccoli and upgrade yeah. to all these things. Yeah. And then you can upgrade each individual version. They have an update command inside of the project so you can you know, self-update. Cool. Uh, but yeah, you get all that stuff at the creation of the project, not the installation of Ember CLI. Cool. Awesome. All right. So there we go. This is the fun part, right? Sorry. Actually, before oh, okay. we jump into that, um, in your example of the Ember app, um, the, just the, the HTML example you had where you have your, right up at the top there, require JavaScript yeah. libraries. Um, you had mentioned additional libraries that your application may need, like Moment or stuff like that. Is there a way to do that almost through like a dependency injection into when you need it instead of loading it on page load? Uh, yes, loading? you could do that. Um, well, you Here it might be a tad easier. In Ember CLI, it all gets built into the vendor JS by default, and okay. it's just there. And it's just okay. It's just there. Gotcha. Um, but you could have your okay. You could have your view say on will insert element. I know I'm about to need something. I could inject a script tag into the 
DOM so, yeah, that already exists. It. You do some jQuery, we go fetch it, watch the on or did load or I'm trying to remember what the event is on that. Yeah. Because I don't do that very often. Okay, now that I know it, now I can do like you could make it happen if you needed that type of optimization. You certainly could. There's nothing um, Ember Ember really stays out of your way. Like okay. its job is to be an application architecture. And it goes, oh, that's HTML and DOM kind of stuff. We'll give you a couple little hooks, but yeah, you know, there's stuff that does that. Okay. Um, like, you can use jQuery all you want. You don't have to use jQuery. Uh, they stay out of jQuery's way. Like, there is no, there's nothing special you have to do to get the two to, to coexist. Yeah. You just, you just are. Same thing with any other library. They just exist. Like, they really do a good job of staying out of the way. Where you'll run into issues is when you try to take a library. Um, what was it called, Josh? Data tables? Is that the big one? Uh, it's a it's a jQuery library. I think it was data tables. I think it's data tables. Very popular table uh, grid library that you do all kinds of data table stuff. And we tried to use that originally to make a grid inside of Ember. And the problem is, is, and you'll see in the templates. Now, you know, imagine you've got some stuff here that needs to be Emberized. Like it needs to have the context of an object. I'm going to link to, and we'll see the example. I need to link to this. I need to go to the user route with this user object. You need it to be handlebar, emberized, interpreted code. Well, you can't do that on somebody else's library. Like yeah. even if they give you a return callback, it's always I'm I'm modifying the HTML that's inside of it. I'm I'm doing something. Like you can't get a true Ember reference, no matter how low you go. Because we started rewriting, and then you had to change some more, and you change some more, and then you change some more. And you're like, well, by the time I'm done, I'm just going to have my own Ember library because I can't get low enough. So that's like the biggest integration problem with Ember. It's not Ember's fault per se. It's that a lot of these libraries that are out there weren't written in a time where there's handlebar templates, where there's this concept of I have live interpretation of the content. I'm not just text. I need to have some code and some logic and some scope with me. But um, you're not able to then pass variables Tell that recipient how to manipulate that text? Depends on what you want to do. If you want to display the text there, you absolutely can. If you want to click it and hard code, like have it hard code a specific route, so it says go here with item ID 12, and then it would load that route. It would have to go load that user if it didn't already exist. Versus an Ember, you can actually just pass that user data. Um, so you can absolutely accomplish it, but to be 100% Ember, if you're doing a lot of Ember things, like we want to be able to have this row and have a drop down that says delete this user, do this thing to this user, we didn't have the context of the user. All we had was a text ID of the user, not the actual user object. Because yeah. that's not, it wasn't an Ember library, so it didn't know how to be Emberized. So visually it looked okay, but when you're trying to use it at that low level, you're missing some connections that you wish you had. So we wrote around. Because <laughs> so data grids are, data grids are a whole other beast. <laughs> Correct, because that code didn't know what Ember was. And we'll come back to that, because when you see how you actually put those things in the code, I think you'll go, oh, I get it, because I don't have access to do that there. So, and if not, we can still talk afterwards. And one of the questions sure. I wanted to ask is you said that with this application, you could email someone this URL, mm -hmm. and they will pull up the same thing. Correct. That means there's no personalization that when you invoke it, it knows you are user 12, and you've got these depends, customization profiles. Depends on what you want your application to do. If it requires authentication, then when your app loads, it require the user to log in, and then you can do something. Uh, that statement was more geared towards uh, if I'm on a page and I have three columns, I want the second column collapsed, I want the third column scrolled halfway down, and I want this mobile to already be displayed, I can capture that entire U that application state in a URL. And when I send it to you, you don't just end up at the home page. You end up with that second column collapse, the third one scrolled halfway down, and mobile already displayed. The URL can represent the entire state of the application, not just a file on disk like your traditional website or web page. It truly is an application, an application state. Okay. Now, you can tie that in with whether they need to be logged in first or not, and there's you know that kind of stuff. So it'll still work. But it, again, it was geared more towards the application state and not necessarily specific user. But you can meld the two together very seamlessly. And all of this is in the URL? 
Yes, it can be. So, how about for all the security consciousness? Is there anything then in all this URL that nope. you don't want people to see? Nope. I mean, what would there be? I mean, you control what goes there. It doesn't yeah. just automatically yeah. type this on. One of the big things that, like the like Tom Dale and, and Peter Katz talked about. Well, go ahead. Well, I mean, you think of a hacker. Do you want to expose? Information right, but it's not going to just be no. there. Is I guess what I'm saying. Like you choose, you can choose what you want to put there. One of their big things is they they think that there should be meaning in the URL. So they've talked about the fact that like if you're playing a game or something and you want to send a link to your friend, it shouldn't take them to to the game and just be at the beginning. Yeah, it should take them to wherever you are in that. But that also rely that that's going to rely on you implementing it so that your app can interpret that URL and go to the right place. But their router and stuff is built in a way to support that. Um, but it doesn't just unnecessarily expose things that you haven't told it to. So you do have control over that. And with authentication and stuff, I mean, and, and the stuff we've written before, there are certain routes where if you hit that route and you're not logged in, we kick you back to an authentication page, that kind of stuff. So. But yeah. then you get redirected back to where you want to go? If authentication After succeeds and you've got yeah, your app absolutely. set up to if remember write, that, yeah, then yeah. If you write it that way. But it's very easy to do that because you can do it in the router. And just watch for states. So everything he said the is really a giant state that machine. That that's, that's all it is. It's a one giant state machine. And the URL is just a visual representation of the state. Yeah. So a good way to think about this, though, is that Ember supports that, yes. but it's up to you to implement it how you want it. Yep. So if you don't want to take a user to an authenticated page, then you'd kick them back to the login screen. But the application or Ember supports you to be able to quote unquote deep link into an application state. That makes sense. Yeah. And All right. In the case where you were giving the example of the second column was hidden and you were two thirds the way scrolled down on the third one, that would have had to have been in the URL in order for that to be accomplished. If you want to be able to share that visual state with somebody else, which is really just a representation of the application state, yes, you would have to do that through the URL because there had to be some way for an external indicator, i.e. the URL, to tell the application what state to be in. If you don't have any desire to sh share that externally, you can manage all that inside your application by setting properties on the controllers and just never expose it out to the URL. Your application can still work this way, and when I go over to this route, and now I'm looking at my profile, and then I come back to my news articles, I can still have my columns collapse and I'm scrolled the right spot, because the application maintained that. The URL is, is think of the URL as a side effect. It's a, oh, I'm also gonna have this if I want to do blah, blah, blah. The URL is not necessary for an Ember application to work. It makes sense to us humans, but it is not needed at all. Yeah. Because you can drop an Ember application into somebody else's website. I mean, let's say you have a website and you want to put a little Ember application here. Well, you're not going to be changing the URL. It can, it's self-contained state. URL is just visual eye candy for us. Now, it's in, not needed. In some of the URLs If your URL had that to basically know that this was user so and so's, you know, session that was open. Well, I wouldn't do it that way. Um, if you shared that, how long is that user, inf you know, information retained if yeah. you could close? Well, it? that would be. That's so let's say is. let's say you implemented it that way, which you absolutely should not do. If you implemented it that way, that'd be completely dependent on how long the user session stayed alive on your server. Exactly. It has nothing to do with your HTML application exactly. or your JavaScript application. Now, you should not be, that's not how you do your user stuff. It should be a, uh, you can keep a value, a, a session ID that can talk back and forth to the server, but it belongs just to that session at the moment. Uh, you can encrypt it. Like, you, you would never, you should never do that. It should never be in the URL. Yeah. So that way it's not accidentally shared. Or seen. Well, I mean, that's just not where you store it. Intentionally shared because if he wanted his friend to see exactly what he was seeing. Well, that would require you to have his credentials to log in, though. Well, so, let's say it wasn't, a, you know, 
this really did get you into Oh, sure. Yeah, you can pass it along. And then as long as your routes, you need to take that, look that user up, and set that model that came back for that information on this controller, you absolutely could. Don't. I mean, I mean but you could. Point, though, at this point, it's, it's not, there's nothing Ember specific about that. Right. At this point, exactly. we're talking about you're building an app in a really insecure way. Yeah. And so Ember will let you do that as much as any other framework will let you do that. Yes. Um, so I've got two examples that I think may help. Um, first, directly related to your last question about the user ID and the URL and stuff like that. If you think about how Facebook works, their URLs have a unique identifier for you as a user. Um, when you share that, depending on if the person that is going to that URL is authenticated or not, changes what they see, but the URL stays the same. So the application itself based on other things outside of the URL changes what is rendered. Um, granted, there's probably some server-side stuff because they're not exposing all of that to the client side, um, which is kind of what your point was earlier. You know, Authentication is gonna have some type of server-side component to it to be secure. So that's, that's kind of one example. The other example was uh, that I had in mind uh, was to your earlier question about the scrolling down and all that stuff. Um, and it being in the URL. If you think about an FAQ section for uh, your application, um, if you want to be able to deep link to a specific FAQs, but you want when a user gets there, it to be scrolled down to that FAQ and that FAQ be expanded, that would be an example where your URL could just be the ID of the FAQ, and then your application itself would say, oh, I know I need to load this FAQ, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll down to that section and have it auto expand it out. So it's not necessarily in your URL saying scroll to this section, auto expand it, it's your application yeah. that's interpreting And that. in that example, your route would set a property on the controller saying this is the ID or whatever to scroll to. When right. your template renders, it would go through its view, and the view would say, hey, do I have anywhere I'm supposed to scroll to? Hey, controller, what's my data? Oh, I'm supposed to scroll here. On my data insert element, I'm going to pick off a scroll to, give it the ID, and the page will get it. Right. Or if I don't want the user to see that scroll, then I can do it on a will insert element, move the position so that way when it renders, it's already there. Again, however you want to implement it. But yeah, exactly. It came in on the router, it got set on the controller, and then the viewer reacted to that data. Yeah. No, I didn't mean to imply that the URL would say scroll two thirds way down okay. column three. Sure, sure. You know, yeah. I, I figured there would be some tag in there that said that was what the yeah. application was supposed to do. For sure. Perfect. All right, so live code. Okay, so I'm using uh, Ember CLI. Uh, so again, you don't have to use this tool. You, can, you don't have to put them in separate files, but I strongly, 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 strongly recommend it. All right, so I already have Ember CLI installed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new project, and I'm going to call it Demo. This will take just a moment, depending on the speed of our internet here, because uh, I'm on a public Wi-Fi. I should probably uh, and all you I should probably also get out of there. I'm sorry? And all you installed was Ember. Ember CLI, which is a node module. It's a npm install. Ember CLI is a project building tool. When I create a new Ember project using it, it will then install Ember for me and other things too. So I'm going to create a new project called Demo. And this is where it's getting the version okay. of broccoli, and cool. we've got brunch handlebars, and ember, and all that stuff. So if you've done three projects over a period of two years, you now have three different versions of broccoli Correct. installed somewhere. But they're self-contained to that project. So you can go back to your source code and still be able to rebuild it based on the version it was written. So you don't install the new version and then it falls apart. Like it's self-contained isolated. It's, it's like using those <coughs> self-contained environments where you can install yeah. specific but it also means three times disk space. Oh, yes. disk Which space. costs no. zero cents. <laughs> yeah. We sell a lot of disk space here. <laughs> <laughs> Do your clouds come with Ember? No. Uh, the clouds are, you can do anything you want to them, but they come empty. Like they're truly like, you choose what you want. We can just give you availability. Give you more, but the general idea is it's 
an empty disk. You do what you want. All right, so I'm going to go into this project. All right, here we go. So I'm going to start up my server. So this is just that way I don't have to have another server somewhere. I can just go to this URL and load it up. I could just as easily build this project and then point my own server URL to that. Like, again, it doesn't matter. They're just files. Um, so I'm going to go to this URL right here because it tells me what it is. It changes depending on what environment you're in. Uh, my home one is different than here. So the point is, if you're like, oh, I went to this earlier. Why did it not work when I hit reload? Well, maybe you're on a different network. It'll give you different uh, private IPs. Well, you can uh, also have multiple ones running. Yes, it'll, you can. It'll change Correct. the number every time you start yep. doing All right, so out of the box with Ember CLI, this is what you get. Boom, welcome to Ember. Um, and there you go. So now let's look at the code. Here's my demo. All right, so out of the box, uh, the app folder is where your app lives. Uh, they have the tests go here. We're not going to spend a lot of time looking at this. It's about the app tonight. But anyway, you get all these things. All right, so here's your application. There's your app. All of this stuff just happens out of the box. This is all code you would have to write yourself. This is whatever CLI gives you. All right. So, so yes. Well, I was just going to say, Ember CLI also uses ES6 modules. So the import and export. Yeah, yeah so all of this stuff up here. Export. So as part of the build process, they're using uh, the ES6 transpiler from Square, I believe. Yeah, they're fixing to change. It's all behind the scenes, so it so doesn't let's, really matter which transpiler yeah. they use as long as it's... So it lets you write ES6 code as long as you write limited amounts of it. Mainly imports, exports, I think it supports let and a few other things. It doesn't have full support, but it has just the support that you need to do Ember. So it lets you do these imports and exports. And then when it does its compilation through that transpiler, it converts them into require um, syntax. So they'll work on any browser out there. You don't have to have an ES6 compatible browser. But this is future proof. And it also lets us here, we have a bunch of shared libraries that are add-ons. And then we can just import them into this application, or that application, et cetera. So we went to this first. Like we went to this as soon as we possibly could. So we can write one shared source library. We have a grid that any project can use. We've got a calendar any project can use. We've got translations. We've got a data layer. We've got all these things that we can just import and use. This uh, transpiler was uh, recently made available in the latest version, or was uh, it always It's been there? out for three, four months, maybe longer. Like, as far as like the stable they're using it, it's from the Square, the credit card reader company. That's the version that's being used right now. Before that, they were using somebody else's transpiler. And like Matt said, I think they're about to switch to somebody else's as well. Uh, as soon as ES6, this, as soon as it supports the browsers, then during your build process, you just won't do transpiler. Your code will be the same. Like, we won't have to change any of our code, assuming they don't change the spec. <laughs> I feel pretty secure they won't on this, but hey. One of the biggest things, and the reason I pointed out is because all the stuff that he went through talked about naming conventions. When you're using ES6, it's going to be looking it up by folder and by structure, like directory structure, so you won't. It's not quite like in, in the guide or in the in the notes he made where it's like app dot and you put you know app dot application controller app dot index controller. Instead, you'll have a file in controller is called application dot js that'll export your. Um, well, we don't have it yet. We will. But yeah. So, <laughs> so the point is, if you don't see where those namespaces apply, that's because this is ES six as opposed to putting everything on that on the global namespace. So that's. Okay. That's why that's so that's unfortunately one of those learning curve things, is you look at the guides, and again, there's nothing wrong with the guides, especially if you're putting it all on a single page. When you switch over to this stuff, it's, you better just know the concept. If you don't know what imports and exports and ES6, like, you know, it's like, oh, I just want to learn one thing, great, I learned four more. And while I was learning one of those other things, I had to learn two more. Uh, and eventually you come back around and you're like, oh, this all makes sense and it's awesome. But don't necessarily expect to sit down in two hours, because if you're not familiar with, you know, half of the concepts we talked about tonight, it's going to be a little rough at the that, that, again, that learning curve. They're very bleeding edge as far as concepts go and technologies. But they don't honestly expect you to build it on the page. They yeah, don't I discuss don't... how to build it any other way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, well, the, the, unspoken, the unspoken is that no, you would never do it that way. But the official guides never talk that's, about that's how like to. The, that's makes kind of weird. Why would they explain it? It's a gap in their documentation. I think the biggest their answer now is use Ember CLI. 
And I think that the, the thing is the documentation tends to focus, it's not necessarily focusing app level, it's focused like here's this concept Features you're looking at right now, here's how you use this, like here's how you instantiate this controller, and that kind of thing. That's honestly one of the hardest things getting started with Ember is, like if you've never had to build, you've never been in the front end doing building, what's brunch, node, bower, you know, all these things, and what possibly went wrong, the uh, Ember CLI website has a pretty big job. Yeah, and if you, so if you use that tool, I mean, it just, boom, we just created an app, here we go. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's go out here to the console. All right, so out of the box, it tells you, well, it'll tell you all your libraries that you have, so see what versions. These are all those auto-generated things. Because remember, you haven't seen me create anything yet. I haven't went created any specific controllers or views or any of those things. This is what's happening out of the box. It automatically created an application route. Um, Controller, the application controller generated an index controller, and you know, all these things. Uh, because we are on the index route right now, so there's the application as a whole, and then you've got routes. This is the index route. And it created this index controller because I didn't have one, but it needs one in order to work. We'll go through creating these as we go. So, anyway, uh, and, and it tells you you didn't specify an index template or a view, so there's nothing rendered. There is nothing rendered right here. This comes from the application. So if I go look at my templates, open up my application, right there. I have no content in my index. But if I had an index template, it would get rendered into that output, which is what we're about to go and do. Okay. So you leave this? No. This is just the hello world. Except it doesn't say hello world. Um, no, we can change this whatever we want. <laughs> So, matter of fact, we're going to change it. Uh, so, let me do this first. So, this is our application. So, since they don't know how you're going to use your Ember application, whether it's the entire site or it's going to be put inside of a div somewhere, they don't make assumptions and give you the HTML body tags because the HTML body tags would not be valid if you're putting it inside of a div. However, we're not doing that, so I'm going to make it a valid, uh, you know, whatever. Now, don't get me wrong, the browser is smart to figure it out. It's not going to kill you. But when somebody pulls it up in HTML, or excuse me, IE4, and it just goes. How do you change your index? So what's your index? No, this is my application. Like this is my whole thing. This is not just my index. My uh, I don't have an index. Yeah, there is. Yeah, it's it's, it's, like, um, it's on the root of your app right there. Oh yeah 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I did that. You're correct. Sorry. We can take this off again. Wrong file. Thank you. Because it wouldn't be working at all if that was all you had. <laughs> yes. There we go. We're back to that. Okay. Yes. This is the main page of serving your HTML that is causing your Ember application to render itself. Let's start with the fire. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, back in here. So, we can just change this and say, you know, whatever we want. We'll just say, um, you know, just so you can see this stuff changing. Okay, so if I save this, uh, as Matt was, no, Josh was talking about earlier, you get the automatic uh, site reload built in. So all I did was save the file. Nice. The uh, Ember watch is watching. It goes, hey, something changed. It rebuilt it. The browser says, hey, something, I just got rebuilt. So it just automatically did this. I don't have to do anything. Live reload. Uh, it's just a handy little development thing. Okay, so well, let's go to our command uh, line. So this is the screen that's just doing the build. You can see it took, um, well, I guess I can look at it here. Uh, it took, yeah, not very long, right around a second to, to do that, because uh, it changed this file right here, and it ran, yeah, 1.9 seconds to do the full rebuild of the code. All right, so I'm going to go to this screen. I'm in the same folder. I will be. I'm in the same folder. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to generate our index route. And again, you can go write these by hand. I'm just using. Ember generator to do it for me because it's so much faster. Okay, so I created my index route. It automatically knew that I was going to want a template to go with it. Remember what we talked about before? What's important? Your routes, your templates, and then any data you want to back it. It didn't create a controller for you because that's you know out of the box. Controllers aren't controllers are powerful, but they're not necessary. But you use them a lot, so don't you know 
don't dismiss them. It's just they're not, uh, not out of the box. Okay. So now when I come back over here, oops, let me do that. I now have an index template. So now I can say, uh, you know, this is the index template. So that way you'll be able to see all this stuff showing up. All right. So, oh, I guess I should explain what we're going to demo besides just the code. So what I figured we would do, I skipped that part. Uh, what I figured we would do, okay, notice how you now have your index template showing. So this was in our application. This is now our index. So what we're going to build is a shopping cart. Very simple, though. Don't be too excited. You're not going to sell stuff from this. But we're going to have a product page that lists the products. You're going to be able to add it to the cart. You're going to be able to go see the items in your cart. You're going to be able to see the totals that are getting updated. You're going to be able to see all this automatic binding that's going on and how all those things work. It's going to be a good demonstration of all these concepts that we talked about. And you can see some things that we also didn't talk about, but you can see them in action. Because uh, again, this is all about productivity and building an application. It automatically can bind your data to those templates. So when the data changes, the visual representation changes. And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to call anything. You don't have to update anything. You don't have to refresh anything. You don't have to register observers. You don't have to do any of that stuff. It just happens. Um, there's other libraries that do that too, uh, Angular Backbone. Uh, you can even get that functionality to knock out. Like the concept is not a new concept. They've just bundled it in a different way. But I think there's a lot more sense and it's easier. All right, so there's our, our, our index template. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I want to create a products page because I want to be able to list out all the products that I want to be able to sell to you. So we're going to generate uh, products routes because I want to be able to go to slash products. All right, so same thing. And when I get out here, uh, I can go to products. I don't have anything because I haven't done anything yet, right? Okay. Does, well, I also need a way. Does that probably have a catch all for the recommended route? Yes. Uh, so, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create some links so you can get back and forth between them. So, what, what did he ask? Oh, I'm sorry. So, he asked if there was a catch all. Stuff instead of products. Correct. Yeah. You're just going to get something yeah. down. I mean, right now it's just going to yell at you, but you can, set it, you can tell it what to do Not like otherwise, or when stuff happens. See this down here? You can set up a handler for that, so you don't get that happening. So you don't you don't get the reaction out of the box, but you get the hook out of the box. The user doesn't see that, does he? Well, if they turn off the console, they wouldn't see it. But this error, if you if you built this code right now in production, you would still get that if they went to an unrecognized oh. URL. Because the route doesn't know where to go. Because you haven't set up the catch-all reaction. Um, all right, so we're going to go create the, uh, a couple of, uh, of links real quick. So I'm going to go back into my application template. Hey, Jerry. Yeah. Look at the uh, router.js. Go over that a little bit. The router. This? Well, yeah. we only have. Well, right, but it got, that got added, right? Yes. Uh, products in 3.0. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So when we added those routes from the command line, the Ember Generate router, they, it came in here and added in our routes. But it didn't have index. Well, index is. It's, it's a default. It's a default. Yeah. Like I can put it here, and literally nothing's going to change other than I just made my code base there. Which again, this space doesn't matter. You can also change paths or something like uh, if you want your your index to be at a different path. So you want your app to run its index control and everything like that. You so you can actually specify a path. But if you don't need to change anything, it gives you actually, index out of the box. This would actually take this URL. Yeah, and right. So you go there. Backwards. Run all of your index. But no, index index is a magic thing. You automatically get an index, just like you automatically get an application. But as we go adding more routes, which we're going to, you'll see this file. I can leave it open. You'll see more things getting added to it. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to my application um, here. I'm going to just throw some HTML because uh, I'm in a template. Notice that uh, so I'm in my templates folder. These have HTTPS extensions. A handlebar. I think it's actually what it stands for. So Hannah Bars is what that stands for. Um, that's just the out-of-box extension. You'd have to go, if you want them to be different, again, for whatever reason, you're going to change your build tool to look for different extensions, blah, blah, blah. So again, even though there's opinions, it's it's all changeable. Just how much of an argument you want to get in expressing your own opinion. Now, when you say change them, are you talking about still use handlebars as your templating? Correct. If you just want to change okay. the extension for some reason. Okay. Okay. Because some projects, like older projects, you'll see uh, actual, uh, it's called dot .template. OK. Um, that was before anybody standardized an HPS. But yes, you're still using handlebar. You're OK. Just a file. At the same time, 
the end user's not going to see that. As right. Correct. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. All right. So um, here is our first little bit of Ember magic. Quick page here. I really should just send it home. We're only on one single HTML page. We're changing view states of the HTML and the elements that you see. We never left another page. The server never gave us a new web request for a single page application. So I don't use the word pages, I use the word views. I'm viewing a different route. I'm not loading another page because they mean something different. If you reload this app, you're resetting the entire state of the application. You're not building a website, you're building an application that happens to be served by a website. And that's the same whether it's Backbone, Angular, Ember, that's not specific yeah. numbers. Just that it's, you're, you're building a single page JavaScript application that doesn't have to run in a web browser either. It can run on a phone, it can run as a plugin to a browser, it can run pretty much anywhere you can package it up. But to the majority of your end users, they still think they're pages. Yes, that's exactly right. Because if you did it right, so you visually, want, you're going to like go to the home view. Right, exactly. Because they won't yeah. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. So I just you know, keep it politically correct and call it home. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's do another one. So what the link to is letting me do is here is I'm specifying a route I want to go to. So this is saying, so this is that, that, uh, this is that Ember magic I was talking about earlier when you're trying to make like a grid. This tells handlebars, or rather handlebars says, okay, I know to take this, and I'm gonna run code, and I'm gonna generate a hyperlink, and I'm going to use this to generate what my URL should be when I click. So that's what the user thinks is happening, but it's really inside the context of this, it's passing off this as a parameter to your router to know where to go. There's other things you can pass in too, like if we were loading a specific user, I can go to the user route with this user object, and I can pass on the parameters, and we're not gonna get that advanced. But it's not as just, you can do more than just this simple creating a link. But it's this ability right here to, to uh, have HTML created for you within the context of your application that you sometimes have trouble bridging the gap with other third party libraries. Because you can't put this into their code because they're not rendering handlebar templates. Is that a Ember specific handlebar software that's made? The link to it, yes. So handlebars, I, I forgot to mention this earlier. Handlebars is a templating engine written on top of a mustache handlebar uh, templating engine. <laughs> and just like, I don't know if you noticed earlier, uh, there were the build tools for brunch and mimosa. Yeah, right. <laughs> mimosa came after brunch. Um, so yes, the link to is a handlebar specific, Ember specific thing. Oh, handlebars was written by the Ember team. Oh. And it's an extension to mustache. Any of your mustache templates will work in handlebars. So you don't have to like, oh, I've got to change them. Like if you already have an app written and it's using mustache, they'll all work. You just get extra stuff with handlebars. Alright, so save this. We'll change the link. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay. And when we come over here. Alright, so now I've got home and products and I can move back and forth. Again, there's nothing here because we haven't done the products route yet. But you can see that the URL is changing. This is not putting the size index, this index is that magic thing. If you actually wanted it to be there, you can turn it on and like specify it, that kind of stuff. Yes? When you use uh, templates as files, do they get cached or do, does it uh, request the template each time? So what happens is during the build process, it goes to each handlebars file and it pre-compiles them and stores them inside in a templates array and they're ready to be executed JavaScript. And then when your Ember application fires up, they're there. So when they get uh, requested, then it says, oh, I've already got this going. I'll just execute this anonymous JavaScript function. Now I've got my template and I know what to do with it and react to it. So during the, pre uh, during the build process, it pre-compiles all of those. If you're putting them all into that single example we're talking about and you load it, the first time the Ember application started, it would then do that pre-compilation. So you, it's faster to do a build because it's doing pre-compilation of your, of your templates. For you. But if there's a, um, now we're, uh, I mean, that's fine with me, we're stepping out of the, uh, can I even get over this one? Yeah, I think I can, yeah, here we go. Uh, I'll come back to it. I haven't done that for the ES6. I think I need to reference a different one. Um, 
I'm old school with this stuff down here in the console. So I'll have to go find out how to get it. Because ES6 has different lookups underneath. That's all. But you can actually see all the templates in here because they're just part of the application. All right, so. Um, then it'll be a single part of that. It, no, they're not separate files. It's no, it, it's, it's, an yeah. array, it's an array of templates by name yeah. and functions to execute to become that template. Yeah, all these files here, none of this exists anymore. The only thing that exists is this file, but you can see that it replaces things. Like it takes this file, puts some stuff in it, the copies it to your disk. Yeah, there we go, yeah. So here's the disk. This is where it puts it. These are your built files. So this is your generated index.html file. And then it puts other stuff into your, your assets, which in this case, our application is called demo. Now, it looks like this in development only. This is so you can get sort of source map working in the console. If we did a production build, this would be one gigantic minified object capture. So this is truly for development only for source mapping uh, because that's an interesting thing with the browsers right now and how you do this stuff. So this is their closest compromise they can reach. Um, and so probably in one of these, okay, here's our templates. So we're exporting, you know, it's just a function Handlebars template, function anonymous, handlebars. At some point in here, you'll be able to find, assuming I can pick a good one there. Yeah, there we go. So there's some code. Um, but all this is, is a, uh, it gets put later into an actual template to run. And bindings and stuff get injected and yeah. as parameters. A lot of magic happens during that compilation state. Uh, okay, so. Let's uh, go ahead. Okay, so we've got our uh, we've got our homepage. We have our products. All right. So now we want to have some products, right? So what we're going to need is a product model in order to hold on to all of our products, because again, that's our data, and these products are most likely coming from the server. Although we're not going to write that part, we're just going to show it all locally. So I could do a Ember generate model products. However, Ember CLI expects you to be using Ember data alongside it. And so it's going to create a model that has imports of the Ember data, the space, and a bunch of that stuff that we're not using for this. So in this particular case, I'm just going to create my own model. Because at the end of the day, what's a model? Just an object that stores some data. Subtle differences in what you're importing at the top. So I'm just going to actually create my own file. Now, I'm not calling this products. It's a slight distinction because this is a product model. This is the object that represents a product. My product's controller has multiple product models on it because it's an array controller. And my product's route is going to show me my collection of products, but they're all individual product models. So that's why you'll see, like, well, why did you put an S on the end? That's why. Because the models are a singular concept. The collection of them is the plural concept. And this is if it was at the bottom, it was a modal, meaning it popped up. I may have transposed the spelling. The A is a modal, which is like those pop-up windows that might be annoying alerts, but an actual like light box kind of effect. Versus a model is the data. And if I miss, if I uh, transpose those, I apologize. I don't think you did. Okay. I mean, there was one that... Yes, there is a modal in the slot, yes. But only one. Yeah, that's completely view related. Okay, so now we get to go into the fun stuff. So let's go look at our model that we just created. Here's our product model. Okay, so because we're using ES6, I am going to import the Ember library from the Ember namespace. I then have to do this. All right, so I want this to just be a model, right? Because that's what we just said our, our models, excuse me. I want this to be an object because that's what we just said our models are. They're objects. <coughs> So, I now have a product model. It doesn't do anything because it can't hold any data. It doesn't have any properties, but that's it. I'm importing Ember for the namespace, and then I am extending this Ember object because now I'm going to do things. So, we're just going to keep it really simple. I'm going to give it a skew. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to give it a price. And I'm going to give it a task value. Boom. We now have a model. That's not even Ember specific. That's just common programming practices. 
I a product? Um, eh, you could. I'm not this demo. I suppose you could. Sure. It'd be valid. Because yes, for this product, this is my quantity. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. So now I'm going to go to my products route because when I go there, I want to have something happen. Remember, my route is going to request my model, and then it's going to attach that to my controller so the view and the templates can know how to render. Again, the template being the one that's really doing that, the view is just helping. Okay, so I am, there's a, uh, a hook inside of the route called model. There's a series of these, we're not gonna go into them, but there's a series of hooks that fire in a certain order. The model hook is where you go and get your data for your model. I'm going to create this. In this case, because remember I said we're not going to go out to the server and get anything. Uh, in here, I would do like a store.find or member data.find, or I do a jQuery uh, Ajax call, or I can do something to go outside to get my data. In this example, I'm not doing that. So in this case, I'm just saying, hey, I'm going to create an array, and I'm going to throw things in that array. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, return my model. Sorry, the dot A you said was? Yeah, so Ember has a bunch of shortcuts. OK. I can do that also. Cool. OK. Uh, Makes sense. You write it long enough, you just get yeah. short, short, short. Uh, yeah, Ember A is just a okay. shortcut to Ember array. Disk space. Yeah. You can make it a regular array, but you're going to find in your Ember world, you're going to want everything to be the Emberized version of the things okay. uh, because they give you maps and they give you filters and they give you uh, proxying and lookups. And, I'm forgetting probably 50 different yeah, things. A lot, of, like, a lot of just polyfills. So okay. Yeah, users. like you're better off just using their version of things. Okay. Um, but you could again, you could just easily make that an array. But again, convention. You're, we can show you afterwards. I can create one, just make that an array, and watch it all blow up. <laughs> because <laughs> that mixes in like proxy mix-ins for lookups against the content model. Like it knows how to be a model on the content. And yeah, okay. lots cool. of magic. Cool. <laughs> uh, the guides explain that stuff really well. That's why I'm not going over it. Cool. Uh, okay, so I've created a model, which right now doesn't have anything, but I'm just setting up the basic, and then I'm going to go to my product template, which remember, out here, uh, it shows nothing. So now I'm going to tell my product template uh, that I'm going to do a, another handlebars helper. And what I'm saying is that as a template, I know I've got a model on me. For each record in that model, I want to render this data. So the each gives you a handy way to loop over the content that's assigned to you as your model. Yes? What would happen if you accidentally do a hash each on an object model or error? So it's not going to iterate then the if you had, accidentally iterate the content. No, no, no. If you had an object model with an array as one of its variables, you could do like each model dot. Yeah, like this this format is you can You're expand not miss anything. I'm just typing. You can expand this the each out to actually say like each. In this case, you could say each like so item in a controller or, or something like that. Okay. Um, but if you don't do that, this is going to assume that you're wanting to hit the controller and that you have an array controller. And there's some subtle differences, but there's just two different ways to iterate using that helper. Okay, so this demo has zero CSS in it, because that's not what we're here to talk about. So I don't want you looking at this guy going, okay, he's seriously, he's putting breaks in for his spacing. I'm not listening to anything else he's saying. I know there's a better way to do it. I'm not doing it tonight. All right. So, did we come back? Oops, did we come back to our products? Wait a second, we still don't have anything. Why not? Didn't we just tell it that I want this stuff? Well, we told it we want that stuff for each thing we have. And when we're over here in our route, we still don't have things. So it's smart enough to not just give you something else you don't want, or blank attributes, etc. Uh, one other little thing that you can do in this condition do it. That's exactly it. <laughs> really? Thank you, Sublime. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. 
There you go. So again, because you have all these bindings that automatically happen for you as a combination of what Ember gives you and what Handlebars gives you, which was written for Ember, you get that type of capability. We have an else condition on our each. So now you're seeing some text. As soon as uh, we put some content into our array, which we're about to do, then the else condition is no longer being hit, and instead you're going to get this other template right about on the screen. That concept, remember when I said if you learn these concepts, there's no other pattern to learn. That prevails through the entire application. Whether you're dealing with dynamically loaded models, you're dealing with a template, uh, you know, promises, like they're all, it all works the same way. So again, once you get used to that pattern, that's it. There's not four ways you have to deal with the concept of loading or any of those waiting on kind of things. One pattern. Okay. So. Uh, all right, so let's go to our product's route. So in this case, uh, we're going to take our model, and I'm going to add an object to it. Now, that is, the add object comes from the fact that I'm an Ember array. And I'm adding an object because, instead of just pushing to it, because internally it's going to fire all the correct, it's going to bind up all the observers, it's going to fire getter setters, like all the Ember magic happens if you use the Ember magic methods. So you add an object to an Ember array, instead of saying push object, which is like a native JavaScript way of doing it. This is, helps keep all that magic wire up. The push wouldn't work, or? Oh, it'll work, but it's, you can push here and it won't yell at you, but nothing's gonna work in your application that you expect it to. Okay. And you'll probably even get error, because it's expected to loop over something, because this isn't an object, I can't call this on it. Like, you'll, you'll know you did it. You can pass a raw um, array into the Ember A, and it'll go through it'll that convert. and it'll Ember Yeah, so. correct, we could do it here too. I just have too many problems. Gotcha. So in this case, again, I'm just adding an object to my array. And uh, we're in the product route, right? So I want to add products. So in this particular case, I have that product model, correct? And so I am going to create an object to add it in here. Ah, I don't have this yet. Again, this is ES6 and Ember CLI specific. I need to import product from my models product. So now I've pulled the product model into my, into the scope as my product reference here. So that way down here I can create my product. Now again, this code we're about to do right here, I'm doing this as hard coded locally in the app. You could make an Ajax call out to get data. I didn't want to write the other half and we weren't going to demo anything. Alright, so, so yes. So there's not technically a collection and then for it's just another model that has models inside it? An array controller is a collection. Correct. There's no oh, native concept of a collection. collection okay. Yeah. It's just multiple records on an array controller is how they refer to a collection. They do have Ember sets. I have not found a use for them yet. They're closer to a collection, sort of. I've been doing this for over two years and I've yet to use it. <laughs> so it doesn't mean they don't have a use. I have yet to run into it. If you use Ember data, they have some things called like a record array. Right? Yeah, they have more things that are closer to it, but that gives you a full fledged like ORM data store that has those concepts. Gotcha. Okay. All right, so we've got a skew. Uh, we'll do, you know, we'll, we'll, we won't do very many of these. First product. Uh, price. Let's just do this. Whatever, right? Okay, so. All right, so we'll do one of them just for now so we can see it. We'll make sure nothing's broke. Now it's going to reload the products. What did I do wrong? You have a few JavaScript errors in there. Oh, did I? You have an extra semicolon and extra curly braces. Curly braces. Yeah, the I think you need the, uh, like, uh, on the add object. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can use that curly brace. The wrapping curly. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, you're right. My object is my object. <laughs> okay, rebuild successful. Oh, look at that. Bit me to it. All right, so now again, I can go back to my home, my products. Um, what we didn't show is I can go directly to this, which you're kind of seeing through the refresh anyway. Um, 
and you know, and it's there. So I can go to any one of those URLs. I can move around between them. Okay, so I can do, let's do one more. So we've got two products in there. This time I'm going to copy and paste. rendering for the tax value, dollar one point five. Okay, I get that. Okay. All right, so uh, one of the things you can do if you wanted to test that everything's working, like let's say I had a part of my app that when I click this button, it adds a new product to my you know, data, you know, whatever, right? You just want to be able to test it. You can come down here to the console, and you can do, uh, you can interact with it, because it's just a member application. Like it's just, you know, rather it's just a JavaScript application. So let me copy this because I do not want to type this. Uh, ooh, okay. So uh, I talked earlier. We can get to it afterwards. I'm just going to hide this high notes and then we'll hit it later if anybody has any questions. They have a dependency injection container that they use inside to manage things. Uh, so I'm going to do a lookup on that container. I'm going to get my uh, product controller. I'm then going to get the model off of it, because remember the route is setting those products on that product controller on the model property. I'm going to get it. I'm going to add an object. That looks familiar. Isn't that what we were just doing in our route? I'm then going to go and resolve my model product so I have an actual instance of that class, and then I can create it. Or excuse me, not an instance, but I have the factory of it, so I can then create it. And I'm going to pass in these values right here. And watch this. Hey, I've got a third product now. Instant binding. Remember the templates? If the model changes underneath, your template automatically redraws itself. Now, if I refresh, what's going to happen? It's going to go away because it's not hard coded into our data. Yeah. It truly was something down here. And if I do it again, hey, look at that. That works for everything in Ember. Again, all those bindings are there. You don't have to do anything. And I'm not saying it doesn't happen in other frameworks. I'm just saying, since we're talking about Ember, it's just there. Just like the back button works. I didn't have to write a single line of code for it to know what to do with the back button and to represent the state correctly. They're just things you get out of the box as an application framework that it just gives you. Okay. So, we've got our... Yes, sir. I'm oh, sorry. Does HTML5 history work in IE8? Does that have a backwards compatible? I think for IE8, it does the hash. Does the hash but you can the use the modernizer and also do like your own shim stuff as well. Like you can give it different things to use for the how it manages location. And you can tell it to use the hash mark if you want to. By default, it's off. I kind of box it off, but you can turn it on. You can tell the location none because you're putting in a div. You can tell it to use hash. You can tell it to use history. And then in place of history, you can actually we have code where we use the modernizer library and say actually use this instead of. And so you can. You can use, they give you three options and then you can customize also. We're very fortunate, we don't have to support current minus one. So, like we have a local storage adapter, 100% pure HTML5 API. Our code base is so light <laughs> <laughs> compared to what it would have to be if we had a bunch of shims lying around. Okay, so we have these product or these properties, right? They came from our model, which we looked at uh, over here. Okay, so here, here's where they are, right? Okay, so what if you wanted to show a user what it's actually going to cost them? Like, what's the combination of price and tax? Well, I don't, for whatever reason, I'm not going to have that coming, uh, you know, it's not pre-calculated, for whatever reason, okay? So we're going to do something inside of our model called a computed property. Uh, this is some uh, magic inside of Ember. Yes, ma'am. This SKU is lowercase, so it's not case sensitive. Oh, so that came from uh, here. Like, it's just truly HTML. Here is where it's important, because okay. it is case sensitive. Okay. This is, you know, I can do this. I feel like not spell. It's it truly, yeah. I should have done that to visually draw attention to it. All right, so I'm going to create this total price. This is going to be a function. And what I am going to do is I'm going to get the price, and I'm going to add the text, and I'm just going to write all this out, and we'll talk about it. 
Okay. So total price is a property on my model that is really a function. And based off some member magic, I'm telling it you are a property, meaning you're a computed property. Um, what do you mean by computed property? I mean that for anything I put in here, I'm going to observe them for any changes. And anytime one of them changes, I'm going to recalculate myself. Let me back up. I'm going to rerun myself. In this case, it's performing an actual calculation. But it's going to rerun this function. So I'm saying I want to watch the price and tax property on this object. And if either one of those changes, I'm going to recalculate total price by rerunning the total price function. What's the total price function going to do? Do it's going to add my price and my tax. I always, 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 always going to use getters and setters in Ember because it keeps the magic flowing. Because when I do getters and more importantly setters, it fires off all the correct observer chains. If I just go and talk to a property directly, two things are going to happen: no observers fired, and you just bork the observers. Nothing's going to work past that point on that property because you have stepped outside the ecosystem. So getters and setters, which are just good practice anyway. They're really good practice inside of a framework like this because it's really the only way you keep that magic flow. So that's what this is doing. So now, I'll save that. I can go back over to my template. I can say total price. And I can say total price. And put another break after. And I can go back over here, wait for it to reload, and ta-da! <laughs> yes, formatting's weird, we're gonna fix it, that was intentional. Now we have total price. We never had that property in our data. It's a computed property. You don't have to watch just things that are on what you are. You can reach out to other things and watch stuff too. We're not getting into that, but you can reach outside of what you are and watch anything you want. Don't watch 122 things unless you need to, and if you need to, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> but it's possible. So that was really you know, kind of an example of business logic being put into the controller. Is there? That's the model. That's the model. Yes. Most of your business logic should live in your models. OK. Your application logic is going to live in your uh, route. Your business logic is going to live in your model. And the controllers are just kind of there. Even though they play an important role in them, just kind of there. So can you, you do a lot with them. Yeah, can you reference? Yeah, correct. Can you reference a function that's outside of this file rather than having a function in the actual model? Uh, yeah, you, you probably could. could, especially with the imports. You should be able to just import it and put it there. I mean, just just in the case where you want to keep that. Yes, because you know what? Separate. So this property is done through a prototype, but you can also do an ember dot uh, computed. I think it's just ember dot computed. You can find the function. So the point is, you could have a function somewhere, tell it that, that is an ever computer function. So when you import it and put it here, it would still work the same way. Because there's two ways to get to it. You could, yeah. if you want it. Yeah, sure. I, I don't think that's necessarily a, I don't think it's a pattern you see often, but you absolutely could do it. Well, I say absolutely without having tested it, sure. but I'm pretty yeah. sure you could do it. <laughs> All right. Um, so now that we did that, uh, let me come over here and show you that all that magic still works the way we expect it to. All right, so remember, again, we were talking where I'm going to look it up. I'm going to get my controller product. I'm going to get my model. In this particular case, I'm getting my first item, so that $14.49 one. Uh, there's also other helper things. Like I said, get object add. And there, there's all kinds of ways to access this. That's not really important. There's a long guy on the other site. But I'm going to set the site, the price down to $100.03. So I would expect my total price to equal $101.53 after I'm done executing this. Oh, I was looking at the wrong one when I did the math. Anyway, the math's correct. I'm just not reading my array positions correctly. It was the second object. But the point being that something externally has changed that price. Not only did our price change because the template is bound to our model, but the total price also changed because it's observing that price property as well. And so the price changed, and then it goes, I need to change, and everything cascades, and voila, there you go. That will reload the application. Sure. You lost it. Because that's not a permanent state. That's not, the, the $100 is not a permanent value in your model. It was something that you were only acting upon your model with. Against. You were manipulating it. Yes, correct. Now, if you wanted to save that, you could say, hey, I want to save this off and do it, you know, whatever. Again, that's all possible. But not tonight? Uh, 
not in this. You want to stay afterwards? Absolutely. But at this demo, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Uh, so, so explain the zero, 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 zero. Uh, that is the uh, the way JavaScript adds floats and can't decide where it should round. We're going to fix it. But that's what happens when you you add two float numbers together. Uh, you, you get to deal with the processor's uh, rounding map. And one thirty-seven and twelve right now. Because they're just pure, they're floats, but they're pure, just pure numbers. There's not any going on. No, no mathematical calculations performed. But when you start, floats are weird. So we're going to fix it. But we but thought that's total why. price did a mathematical. I'm sorry. We thought total price was doing it. It is. That's yeah, total price is the addition of these yeah. two things. Right. And because you're adding this as a float and this as a float, you're getting the weird JavaScript computer float results. We're going to fix that. Like that's part of this demo. Like how you can fix that. That's not an Ember thing. That's just a JavaScript thing. But we're going to use an Ember thing called the Helper to fix that. All right. So now we've got products, right? So now we want to be able to show the users these products. We want them to be able to add them to the cart. So based off everything we've talked about so far this evening and what you've seen in this demo, what do we think we need in order to have as to add items to a cart? Like what kind of concepts are we talking about? Are we going to need? A model for sure. Yeah, we're going to need a card model. Something's got to hold it. Functions add. Yep, exactly. We're going to need some sort of capability to add to the cart. We're going to need a cart's route so we can go to it. We're going to need a cart's template so we can see it. Uh, and actually, we're not going to use a cart model because we're just going to use an array to hold all these other models. The cart as itself, it could be yeah. its own model as a concept, but for this demo, we're just leaving it truly as just a collection of things. So the cart is just going to be an array holding other models. Doesn't mean it has to be. We have some stuff, but we have a card that is a model, and it, it, it's interesting. It's all about this. So it's going to be more than, than a product array. It's going to be a model array. Correct. And we're going to be putting product models in it. It's just an array. It doesn't care what you put in it. The thing that's keeping it from breaking is that we're not breaking it. Like we're only adding products to it, and we're expecting them to be products. So when we do things, that's what we expect. If you want to add something else in there and it breaks, well then. You know, your, the code is doing the adding. You can do a hey, is what I'm about to add an instance of a product model. If it's not, don't let it in. Like you know, you can do those kinds of things. Uh, again, beyond the scope of what we're what we're demoing this evening. Okay, so uh, okay, so here we go. Let's create. Yes, thank you. All right, we're going to do a Ember generate. You can type out generate again. It's a shortcut. Uh, we're going to create a cart controller, and in this particular case, I want it to be an array controller. So I'm telling it again, this is just some Ember CLI magic. And I'm also going to create a, uh, a products controller. Which doesn't seem evident at the moment, but I'll just show you why in a moment. So let's go. So nothing changed here. Let's go to our. Let's close the page. All right. So now we're going to go look at our products template, which is what we were just looking at. Visually on the screen, we're going to add a button. We're going to say add to cart button. We are. Boom. Okay. Great. It will load itself. Hey, look at that, I can add to the cart. And not that. Obviously, we haven't done anything, right? Now, you might be tempted to say, oh, this is a form. I'm going to wrap a form tag around it. I'm going to do certain things, and you know, that kind of stuff. That's not the Ember way. Instead, what we want to do is we want to tell this button that when you are clicked on, I'm going to give you an action to, to do. I'm going to watch, I want you to trigger this action, is how you need to think about it. I'm going to call my action add to cart. You can call it anything as long as it's not like some zero JavaScript word that you can't have a function called that. Blah, blah, blah. All right. And I need to add, or excuse me, I need to close it correctly. Okay, so action is another handlebars helper, something special you get with Ember. So I'm saying that when I click this button, I want the add to cart action to be thrown, and I'm going to pass that action as my context this 
What is this? <coughs> this is the current model of my each. So my product one, my product two, my product three, it's the context. Because that's how we can pass these things around and get all of this magic. So is that action always a click? No, by default it's a click. You can listen to anything. It comes out of the box wired for I think like 30 or 40 events. And if you want to add any special ones, um, like copy, paste, that kind of stuff, you can really easily register those as well. Okay. They used to come with every event registered. And then they realized only a handful of those really get used, and everything that's registered is heavy. Like it gets heavier. So they back it off and they only watch, uh, there's a list, but they, they check like keys, clicks, I don't know. There's like seven or eight that watches by default. Maybe there's a few more. And then you can add in all the, any of the other ones you can need really easily. Okay. Um, and then do you define that in your function? Is it check for the event or do you do it? Uh, well, in this particular case, I don't have to tell it to check for the check because by default, actions look for checks. Right. Or uh, not checks, but clicks. So the clicking of this button is automatically going to fire this action or trigger this action. And it's going to call this add to cart action. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on my product route up here. In the order of it doesn't matter, I just like my actions at the top so I can find them. So I have an actions object. Uh, it's called add to cart. It's a function. It's going to take in my model. I could just as easily call it product, but the point is I want to be able to, in my Ember application, I want to be able to copy and paste stuff around. If I'm like, oh, I also need this over here, we're tweaking. I don't want to be like, I'm going to change every instance of product because now I'm not on the product route, I'm on the cart route, or I'm this or that. Models are concept, I mean, it's the model. I just don't care what type of model it is, so I just call it model. It's, again, easier. It keeps you from having to get locked in on stuff. You can call it whatever you want, just pass it around. Uh, but in this particular case, I am going to do a little bit more magic we'll talk about. OK, so I created an add to cart action. That is a definition to catch that action that was triggered from my template. Since I'm in my router, or excuse me, since I'm in my route, I have a method that I can call called controller for. So I can say I want to get the controller for the cart. So now I've reached out from this route and said, hey, controller over here that manages this, come here. Now I'm going to add this model to your content or to your list of models. Push object works here because model has already been created. That's why you see the push object here instead of the add object. All right, and uh, that should be good. Now, in all of this, you have the open parentheses, space value, space close parentheses. Personal preference. That space is not required. Personal preference. No. This is dope. This is just plain JavaScript. Yeah, because when it gets flattened, it's all going to be one and I. It is purely personal preference. One question. Sure. And the, we can answer this later if you want to. Um, your actions. Mm -hmm. What's what, what's kind of give a rule of thumb of when you put an action in the router versus the controller? So you should always consider putting it in the router first. Um, because. The route is what sets your application state. It says, I'm going to put data on this controller, I'm going to render this template, I'm going to do these things, I'm going to go get data, I'm going to react to data. Now, if the action is, I want to hire, show a row in a table, I want to expand and collapse, that's 100% view. That has nothing to do with anything about your application, put it on your view. It doesn't even belong on the controller, like it belongs on the view. But if I'm adding a product to a cart, well that's what, what am I writing? I'm writing an e-commerce application. That's an application thing. That belongs at the route because that's where your application logic sits. Not your business logic, because that's models. But your application logic sits at the route. Now, can you put it on your controller? Yes. Like, you shouldn't have add to cart actions on your vehicle. That's horribly, horribly wrong. There's, that's just wrong. You can make an argument for controller, but I would talk you out of it. Because you'll find as you write larger and larger applications, the route is where they make sense because you want to start sharing things. Controller should be able to, okay, I'm looking at my products. I'm a product route. I'm going to go get my product data. I have 120 properties about them. I'm then going to throw them into this controller. That controller says, well, this is how I'm going to handle products when they're on sale. Like I'm a, I'm a, I don't know, I, I like shoes better. 
Well, now I said, wait a second. You know what? I want to show those same products, but I want to show them over here in a different way. I throw a different controller at it. Because remember, your controller just decorates your data. Not visually like in an HTML, but from a, from a logic standpoint, from a presentation, from a representation standpoint. So your router is the one that should be handling, hey, I'm adding and I'm removing, I'm doing things. The controller is just what has to be gone through for the display of it. They can be heavier than that. And it's, that's when you see them, you're like, wow, they seem pretty heavy. Why would you go here? And that's a weak spot in Ember documentation. They don't talk about this. When you start building a really big application, you want to be able to swap controllers in and out based off of something the user did. Well, wait a second. Now my action just went. The moment I have to put the same action in two controllers, that tells me the lowest common denominator is the route. So you'll start, and you'll think they go on the controllers. But you'll eventually wish they were on the routes. And, right. Can you say that better? Or? No. I mean, so it's hard to explain. If, you're, if your action has just been to modify your model, and that's it, then you could probably think about putting it on the controller. And you would be OK to do that. Yeah. But um, if, it, if it's doing something bigger, yeah, put it on the route. Yeah, the guy doesn't talk. No, I've looked and looked and looked to figure out what's the rule of thumb on this, on this, and so I never had time. Anything, so but even good. if you put it on the controller, why couldn't you move it to the back? You could, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Event bubbling, or is that what it's called? Yeah, correct. That a, that's a, it goes up the routes. So it doesn't correct. When you're well, event bubbling is different, different, but this works the same way. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the actions will bubble up as well. The They'll go through the controller and then up to the route and then the parent route and the parent route. Until yeah, that's that's another reason if you're trying to architect this. Yeah, because exactly. The idea is that I've got this thing, and if I want this controller to react differently, I can define the route there. So again, maybe my maybe by default my application knows that I'm going to add to cart, and add to cart's a wrong thing. Maybe I'm going to display user data a default way. But if I'm using this controller to render it, it wants to do something different. It can define it there, and it stops. Dropping a different controller does something totally different. Dropping a third controller that didn't care, and it'll bubble itself back up to here. Like here's where things always end up unless you intercept them. He could um, he could move this to the application route, yeah. and it'll still work, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, that. Just... so they they don't bubble up they higher do. than the first place. So it's, it's if, not, you it's not if you don't return true out of the first place it's defined, that's where the bubbling stops. Okay. But if you return true, then you can keep piling them on and say, hey, I reacted to it. Somebody else can now too, and it'll just keep going and going and going. In your development mode, it will yell at you if nothing catches it. But that doesn't happen in production. Like once it's built, those errors don't occur. But in dev, it'll let you know, hey, something just threw an action and nothing caught it. <laughs> but that might be OK. Like there's times where you're like, yup, that's fine. <laughs> All right, so when we're over here, I've got my add to cart. And I'm going to click. Trust me, it's working. We're going to see it in a second. It's not Eric, so you know it's working. Like we haven't done anything to actually see the cart yet, right? We've added it to the cart controller, yeah. but we don't have any interface to it yet. So that's the next part we're gonna build. Your console to see it? I could. I'm not going to, but I could. Yes. I alright. So alright, so over here on my cart controller. I'm going to create another computed property. Same thing as before, right? It takes, uh, uh, it takes external input, does something with it, although it doesn't have to be external, the idea being. I'm going to this function. I'm going to return, oh, okay. I'm going to return this dot get. So content is a magic word inside of the controllers. It's just a, uh, excuse me, it's a proxy property to the model property which is where your model is being set on the controller. So content refers to model, they're the same thing, they just proxy each other. And the model property is where your model gets set. Uh, so really in this case, I'm thinking about I'm kind of old school, it's the model. It used to just be content, model is the correct, preferred way. Do it. Oh, yeah, I guess that kind of good I'm not sure if model is but I don't know. So I was going to get the content and get the length off of it, but Matt's correct. Because it's an array control and it proxies all of that, I can't actually just ask for the length property off of itself. Because it's an array controller, this is the length of the data that's set on the model property. Because ultimately, I want to know how many items I have, right, in my cart as I'm adding them. 
and I want to keep up with uh, the count, right, every time that I add a new one. So in this particular case, there's a little bit more informatic of each, which says I'm going to watch each element in my array. So that way, when I add a new one, I can react to it. This is how it says watch the array as a concept. So if new things are added or removed, I can react to it as a whole. It's not saying if one of the properties changed on an item in my array. It's telling me if my array changed. That's what each does. You can drill down to specific properties and you can, you, know, you can do all that kind of stuff. But that's what that does right there. It says watch the array for any changes, essentially to its length. Essentially. Has something been added? Has something been removed? If so, fire this function. How is length not a property you can just, like, this seems like such a low level thing. How is length just not directly available in a template? Or? It, it is. Oh, okay. It's just showing Okay. Yeah. You could. It's, it would be very semantically like, you know, item, item count is more semantically like, if you see it in a template, you're like, oh, it's Yeah. Okay. But you, yeah, you're correct. Yeah, there is a level there that, honestly, I didn't think of what I was writing in, but probably should have picked a different well, no, example. Like, now, <laughs> now you've taught us this at, at Simple. I was just think, I was just wondering, like, if, if this was. You're simple. correct, yes, because it is a property on the controller. Yeah, it would come across. It's available in the template. Okay, cool. Because that length is a controller property right. against your model array. And so now that we did all of that, I'm going to. Yes, okay. So I want to put this count in my application template. Okay, I want it to transcend wherever I'm at homepage, the products, the about us, whatever. So I need to go and put some stuff on my application controller to be able to access this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create that application controller, because so far it's just been dynamically generated from it, right? So I'm going to create uh, my array controller, but I only need it to be an object controller, because I it's not going to hold anything, it's just some properties. So I'm going to create my array controller, or excuse me, my application controller. Okay. Now I'm going to go to my application controller. So we talked about the dependency injection, kind of, sort of, just as a rough concept. So this controller needs data from another controller, right? The, in order for the application controller to have data available to the, to the template, it needs to get the item count from the cart. So I'm going to need the cart controller. And this is just Ember's way of resolving dependency injection, of being able to say, I need that this way, I pull it across, that kind of thing. So now I have an import. It's going to give you the actual live instance of that coming off of that container. So it knows how to do all that lookup automatically by itself. And then I'm going to create a property that I can use inside of my template called cart count. It could be, again, anything you want to be. And I'm going to make it a computed property because I want to watch the count of the cart, right? So the cart updates itself whenever it changes, but I need this property to be bound to get as well because I need my template to update whenever this updates. So it updates, great, I update, my template updates. I'm not creating this connection between them. But I don't, I'm not gonna do it as a computed property. I'm gonna just do this as an alias, just so you can see another little bit of a member uh, capability. So what I've done is I said, I wanna create this property called car count. I'm gonna make it a computed alias. So I'm truly just creating an alias saying, this property is equal to this. Controllers dot is how you access anything in the needs. So I'm going to need my cart controller, and then I'm going to grab the item count property off of it. So now everything's all wired together. Which, if we go to our application template and put it in, you'll be able to see it all happen. So I can come in here. Those are my links. I'm going to add a number of items in cart. Count. Page of refresh. I have zero. Why is it zero? Because that's the length of my uh, cart array, correct? Mm -hmm. I'm going to start adding items to my cart. And look at the magic. Because this is the cart count property, that's a computed alias to so the item count computed property on my cart. 
my application controller, the my cart controller, the cart controller is giving me back a computer property that is its link. Every time I hit this add to cart, it was bubbling up to the product's action, saying I want to add this. This is great. I'm going to grab my I'm going to grab my cart controller and I'm going to just push that product onto that array and just keep pushing, pushing, pushing. So we tied it all together now. So why do the needs have a square value? Because it's an array. I can need more than one. I actually don't have to do the array there. If it's a single, I can just give it the string. But again, I don't want to go back and type more. I don't want to change it later if I need to add another one. I just always make it an array. I just get into that habit. That way I don't forget later. Other developers will see it. And then they, so let's say another developer opens and sees a string and goes, well, I don't know how to need a second one. <laughs> I understand what an array is. It's just, you know, it's just those power tips. Okay, so now let's uh, finish this off by putting our cart control so we can actually see all the items that we added to our cart which is you know, easy enough. Uh, let's go and create our, uh, let's create a cart route without the word control reference. All right, so now I've got a cart route. Let me go change this real quick. Now I want this whole thing to go to the cart route, which at the moment it won't because we don't have the cart route. Well, we do, but it's empty. We'll show it. Uh, so we're just going to do this. Now let's go create the cart template real quick. All right. I'm going to lay out this one. Let's do this cart. Let's go grab our product. here. We can add a card, add a card, add a card, and let's throw one of these. We should have three of these and one of those. Now when we go look at our cart, we have one, two, three of those, and one of those. The hardest part, granted I copy and paste it, the hardest part of that entire cart right there was typing out your template. HTML and CSS is always the hardest part if you're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's look at a couple, uh, a few more little uh, magic things, and then I mean we're pretty much uh, wrapped up at this point. Um, so let's go to our back to our application controller. And, uh, yes, I know my application controller. I'm going to create a cart total because I want to display up there also like how much is this order going to cost me as well. Uh, so again, you see we're just doing the same pattern over and over. Like you, you, you learn a majority of the patterns in Ember. There's a few more complicated ones, but this is it. It's just repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. Uh, all right, so we're going to do another uh, ever computer alias. Controllers and a car, uh, car total. Uh, in our template up here, I'm going to say, Because I just wanted to show that. You forgot to tell. I'm your, sorry? Uh, in your cart, for your application, you forgot to tell them the controllers. Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. That would yell. Probably already is. All right, yes. Okay. So, what I'm saying is in this here, I want to be able to show the cart total. What's the cart total going to be? It's just another computer alias over to here. Oh, yeah, okay, great. i got to go create that now, so let's go on our cart uh, controller. And this is a better example for you, Greg, because now this isn't just length. <laughs> cart total. Oh, it gets better. First time I've used a match reduce function. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to return a total. So in this particular case, I am getting my content. Because I'm an array controller, I inherited all those fancy things. One of those fancy things is the reduce function. So I'm going to use the reduce to calculate my total. Total 
probably should look familiar. So I, I want a cart total, right? So what I want to do is I want to loop through every product that's in my cart, and I want to sum its total price. And I want the total price because I want the price plus the tax. And we've already created that total price property, which is a computed property aggregating those two together already for us, right? So I don't need to recreate that logic. So I want to watch each element in my array, specifically the total price. So if price or tax gets updated somehow, and I, I know that's honestly a realistic, you know, uh, pattern, like. Again, how's that changing on your application? But the point is, if you change the price or you change the tax, that's going to trigger the total price to change. If the total price changes, that's going to trigger this to recalculate. And what's this doing? I'm just using some fancy, uh, you know, some fancy logic here to do a map reduce. This says go through each one of these. You're, you start with zero as your value. Go through and grab the total price, and just go through every one that's in there and keep reducing until you have none left, and the total is your total price. What's that character near the end of line 11? That is a closing bracket. Zero. No, it's not zero. zero. The this purple is zero. Thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the, the reduce takes a starting value gotcha. as a second argument. For back here, it looked like the at sign, and I was oh, sorry. No. totally oh, confused. I, guess, I, should, I never asked. I guess we could have made that larger. It's too late now. But sorry. Well, everything um, else was fine. It's just the purple. It's... All right, so now when we come out here, uh, we're going to go back to products. You notice cart was empty because, again, we just refreshed the entire app. We had nothing in our cart. All right, so now we've got zero, zero, right? So if I click this, uh, assuming I can do this math correctly, I would expect this to be $15.64. Oh, no, because no, total I need to drink. Yes, again, I'm looking at the wrong field. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Don't trust users. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so again, as you see, as I start doing this, and we're going to fix that floating thing. That's the very next thing we're fixing. Uh, again, not only am I getting my count, I'm getting my total price count of everything going on in my cart. And if I want to show you one more little thing of how to prove that that's all working correctly, let me grab this. And I can come out here, and if I change the tax of my, let me make sure I'm reading this right, if I change the tax of my first one, <laughs> let's say I change it to $200 so we can see a big jump. I would expect us now to change it to $314 and you know, blah, 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 blah. It's not going to change the no. tax. That's displayed here, though. It's only the one on our cart. Oh, yeah, I should have heard her. Sorry. Thank you. See, you guys are paying attention. There we go. If I change the tax on this one that's in the cart, not my products, but my cart, I still would expect to see this jump to $314. And visually, this should change to $200. It should change to $214.49. And for the first time this evening, I actually have all the correct. Look at that. Oh, so that's hitting every instance of that. Yeah, in this particular case it was, because we didn't make a distinction between them, because they're the same model. Yeah, I didn't make that. There's more you can do with the demo. When I wrote this out, I only had three things in my cart, and I picked the right one. Yeah. Right. I, I, I was looking at how the sausage is made. <laughs> no, I, 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 just, I just expected each item in the cart to be a separate instance of the model. So I only expected this no, because. <laughs> Yeah, if you scroll down to one of the ones with the skew of their taxes, they're not there. Yeah, their tax is still that. I just expected only one of that first skew to update. Yeah, it's because it's because I got that object, but they're all the same instance of that object. I, I didn't. You didn't clone the object. No. Yeah, when I put it in, exactly. I didn't do it. Like, I could have done it, like, I could have used item controllers in the, um, in the template to give it a different context, so it would have been different. Uh, or I could have, yeah, I could have done it differently. Like, cart, yeah, you weren't supposed to see this, because cart, when you start getting into this part of it, there's a few more things you have to solve. Right. Yeah. Uh, that go beyond just this generic funding. You, you have some data concepts you have to attack. Yeah. You yeah. have the same thing with removing. If I put a remove button in here and remove one, it'll remove all instances oh. of that one. Oh, okay. Cart, which is what you don't want. I mean, it's easy enough to do. It's just, mm -hmm. yeah, we didn't go that far. All right, so uh, that's cart total. That's uh, that. Um, Okay, so we can do the helper to fix this, and then that's the last thing. Okay, 
So uh, let's go to here. Let's do a Ember generate. We're going to create a currency helper to help us format all that currency and the floating math and all that fun stuff. Um, all right, helper currency. All right, so everywhere that I'm using the price right now, where I've got prices displaying, I'm going to tell it to do this, which is Handlebar's way of saying, I want you to run it through this helper. So it's going to use the currency helper to display prices. It's going to use the currency helper to display taxes. It's going to use the currency helper to display total prices. So we're going to do that here. We're going to do that here on cart total. We're also going to go do it on our products template as well, because again, everywhere I'm doing prices, I want to do this. Okay. Then I'm going to go open up my helper. Are you able to do anything like that with the model, so you yeah, don't have to update the review? Yeah, you can. Okay. I mean, you could do it uh, one of two ways. I would just create a computer property, you know, like tax formatted, price formatted. Okay. Or you could write a custom... I would just do this with properties. We've gotten some fancy magic <laughs> going on where we've, we bring it in. All right, so we load the data in. As the data comes in, uh, we have a base model that we then loop through and get all the properties and run them through cleaners and then assign them to the object that actually is the one extending for a real class of the instance. So what you get is the property you're expecting, the way you're expecting, already formatted because we took care of it at a level you don't even see in the code. Nice. You can get really fancy. At first you're like, oh, that's magic. Like, if I'm a developer, I'm just using this, what the hell? And then you use Ember for a while and you're like, eh, screw it, there's so much magic going on. It's time for some of my own. Um, you either are okay with the magic or you're not going to use Ember. Because there's, there, there's just a crap load of magic. Um, at first, I was kind of like the, oh, I'm not a fan of that. And I'm like, look how much stuff I don't have to write. I'm on board. <laughs> and now I'm just like, whatever, if you don't want to read a manual, then I guess you're not going to order my app. Trade-offs. But yeah, we have some really fancy math on magic going on in our models. So we don't have to recreate every hands of the computer property. Now, is this formatting stuff something that you could also, or would you ever do that in the controller? Yeah, you yeah. can do it there too. Okay, because the controller is decorating. Pop the model. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Yeah, this is more just a hey, this is what a helper is. Yeah, yeah, cool. Absolutely. Okay. Um, because there's going to be times too where you're going to want your helper to have to talk to the controller to find out which locale should format the currency in. Yeah. And right, if you're like doing that, down. then why not just do it on the controller? And why not have a mix in, which is another object that you can mix in its capabilities into this object, and it with it is a currency mix in, and now it has yeah. three methods that are automatically available. It has an init that can say, go over all of my keys and just automatically format them for me. Or override the getters, that way, when it gets called, do this. And Yeah, there's yeah. 10 different ways you can solve yeah. that. Okay. This is the absolute simplest of simple, but it's not gonna get you very far. Sure. It's specifically solving a currency problem. Sure. It just okay. fit into the demo, but absolutely. Love it. So what helper is this? This is a currency helper. Does so it make handlebars done? Yeah, so in order to make a handlebars helper in Ember, you have an Ember handlebars make bound helper. And you want it to be bound so that way if the property you're displaying gets changed somewhere, you want it to be able to change also. You can make an unbound helper, which is truly gonna just render you know, it'll change the display however you want it to be displayed, but it's a one-time thing. You go change that data and it's not going to update. And the reason why they made those distinctions is because every observer adds a little bit of weight to your application. If you have things that just need to be formatted, I need to format this data a certain way, but I'm never going to react to it changing because the data is not going to change out from that point. Then why, in a, a table of a thousand rows, am I going to have a thousand listeners to something that is never going to change? Yeah. So instead, I would make an unbound helper so it truly doesn't add, you know, doesn't have all that extra weight. That's on you. Like you have to decide which one you want when. Ember can't decide for you. Uh, but there's those kinds of things where there's different types of things where you can you can also use an unbound in front of a variable name in your templates. Like we were saying, price and, and uh, name. You can say unbound. That's a built-in helper that automatically gives you that unbound helper. But if you need your own special unbound logic, you can create an unbound helper to find that function. All right. So 
Because we're using Ember CLI, like if you go read the manual about handlebar helpers work, there's a difference between how Ember uses them and Ember CLI uses them and how it resolves the names. Ember CLI wants you to have a dash in the name. So it would have had to be like display dash currency or change currency or show currency with dashes because its resolver expects a dash to be there. You said CLI does or? Ember CLI expects that. Okay. But Ember does not. However, when we were digging around in the, in the source code to confirm that we were telling you the correct thing, we found in the master branch of Ember that it looks like that might be changing. But we can't quite tell which direction they're changing it towards. So the point is, at this moment in time, don't get hung up on what I'm commenting out or how I'm making it work, because this is very, I'm making Ember CLI work like Ember works. So when you read the Ember manual, you'll see the code and go, oh, I remember seeing that code. Gotcha. But it won't work in Ember CLI that way unless you do what I'm about to do. The point of it is I want you to see that I can format the currency inside of the helper and my template, I get what I want. This is one of those things where at the moment, those two tools, the framework and the tool, are in slight disagreement with each other. Okay. And it's all about automatic resolution. So when it looks in the template, it knows how to get there faster. Am I a property? Am I a template? Am I a component? Because components have dashes in their names also. Uh, so anyway, so that's why uh, I'm doing what I'm about to do here, which is I'm ranking some of this. Oops, I'm making some of this stuff out. Because in this particular case, I don't want it to do its magic of creating it for me. I just want the function, and I'm going to do the creation somewhere else. That way, I can bypass its expectation of maintenance standards for auto resolution. So again, don't get hung up on that part of it. Um, but that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And then I'm going to go to my app JS, and when I'm over here, this is that main file that's setting everything up. I'm going to import my currency helper from helpers. Ember handle bars, uh, register uh, helper. <laughs> that looks familiar. I'm going to call it currency and I'm going to give it that function. So now, what I would expect to have happen out here is what's it rebuild? It's going to be up to the Now I think it's because of the, uh, just a moment. I'm going to have the path to that. that. Yeah. Will it just be like some, just helpers? No, you know what? That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see if it will work. Yeah, it yeah, builds correct. Thank you. Okay. So, at the moment, if I go to products, I add some products. Well, nothing's different, but that's good, right? Nothing broke, because I didn't tell it to do anything. I told the helper, take in the value, return the value. I haven't done anything yet. This is what my helper is. Return the value. So, I would expect that to be exactly what it is. So, now what I can do is I can do this. And now we'll get some pretty math. Again, there's better places in a large application to do that. Sure. Like you should be doing it at the data, you know, rounding correctly, blah, 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 blah. Uh, But again, for the sake of this argument, or for the sake of this demonstration, now I'm not getting my float math. That's all wonky because I'm formatting. The number underneath is still wrong. <laughs> the total price value and this total cart total or cart total is wonky. But the display of it is not because I just told it to zero. fix it to two digits. Plus he got a zero following one Yes, yes, exactly. Correct. Because we use the currency helper everywhere that we were displaying our property. If I remove the currency helper from there, it'll be broke just on that. Because again, it's just a visual you know, color. So that honestly went way longer than I was expecting. I apologize. Oh, good. <laughs> way longer. But I hope, that's the end. I hope that that has given you a really good overview of the concept of Ember and how quickly. I mean, at the end of the day, we didn't write a lot of code. 80% of that was talking. Can you share a version of this on GitHub? Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. I will get that link out. Probably not tonight, but I will get it. Good. Good. And I mean, we can we have about well, ten more minutes. We can stay longer. We work here. So if you have any questions, feel free to say. <laughs> but, uh,
yes. I have a. Oh, I do have another slide. Okay. I have an application I need to build. Uh, I wonder if this is practical or not, but I need to have some sort of uh, dynamic templates where uh, form fields are being built dynamically when the page loads. So if the the application, the Ember application is pre-compiled, is that uh, feasible? Yeah, absolutely. There you, is, would, um, you would do it the same way that you're doing the, the list of objects or, or products. But you can put any code in there. Right. If so if I render the, the actual HTML uh, template on the page, it will, I can use it live? Yeah, you can create, so we have those view files. You can create views that are self-contained themes. So you could say, this is going to be an input field. This view is an input field. And I'm going to have these types of properties, and I'm going to do stuff. And there's already built-in input fields. But you can say, here's my template. And you can have all these things. So in your code, you say, I want to use this thing. It knows how to render itself. So you could dynamically react to a list of configuration options and have pre-built. Like you know how you know what the reaction should be based off of I want this, this, and this. And so they were already pre-compiled and pre-built, and then you just do the arranging of them. Yeah. And if you need those to dynamically build themselves, you can do that also because it's just properties at that point. You can say I want this template yeah. to render part two. I want to render this template inside of me and that template, or I want to take these two things. You can reach in and actually get the template string and. and we do things with it, even though it's been compiled. Like you have access to all that. We just didn't touch on any of that. I don't know if I explained the, the, the question correctly. What I mean is, let's say uh, the the page itself is being served with uh, PHP, and each time there's a different set of uh, form fields. Right. Is that uh, what you're saying is applicable there? No, you're not creating the form fields with Ember. They're like already created on the page. Right, that's what, what I mean. Uh, it will, there will be different than each Yeah, page. so your best approach at that point, off the top of my head, would be to run as part of the PHP serving of it, like the pre compiled P. The, look at what the uh, Ember Handlebars pre compiler right. logic's doing, do the same thing. So when your PHP renders, there could be those templates ready for the Ember application to consume. Oh, well, because you mentioned they compile into a, a template array. Correct. So I can. I mean, the JavaScript functions, and they have certain syntax. But as long as you replicate the end result of it, you can have the PHP generate them. If you want, have the PHP generate that uh, uh, JavaScript array where it said that. Well, like, you would define. And you put them in your own array. When the Ember application loads up, I would have a application initializer that says, "I'm going to defer my readiness. I'm going to go reach out into the global namespace of my JavaScript." Pick up this random array that I know is there for PHP. Take that, add it to my templates array inside of Ember. Now I'm going to advance my application readiness. So now when it goes, all those templates are available to me. Right, that, that will work. I mean, there's other ways, but that's yeah. just the one off the top of my head. Yeah. Now the, the hard part is going to be: can you get? You're going to have to recreate the creation of those, the compilation of those templates. You're going to have to recreate in PHP. Yeah, I, call out I, to a node server that runs the Ember Hamblebar's compiler, and you pull that back in, or you're gonna have to look at the logic and say, this is what they expect. I'm gonna write my own Hamblebar's compiler in PHP. There might already be a library. I don't know. It's basically from what I saw there, it, it showed that at some point uh, the, the template array yes. was sort of like an array containing some, like a defined function. And yeah, it there, it's some, a list of, of anonymous functions with a name. And, and the templates were escaped. Yeah. So and there's yeah, a few other little syntax things too. I mean, there's a little bit more that goes into it, but that's pretty much it. Yes. Yeah, I think it, it could work. I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so real quick, this is another diagram that you know I had one before that was a lot simpler. Same thing. It's just we added a few more things in. Now you can talk about the events, you can talk about the actions, all those things that we just added in the demo. Mm -hmm. um, so and the slide deck will be up there too. Um, and so anyway, uh, you know you can see the needs between your controllers, your views, your temperature routes. So again, it's everything we talked about. It just shows you. There's more lines on that graph than what we started with. So when you're all done, what, what actually gets put up on the production server? Is it one HTML file, a huge JavaScript file? Or one yeah, so the way you ever see a line gives you out of the box is you get an, or an HTML file, you get a vendor.js, which includes everything that's not your application. So if you load in Moment, you load in Bootstrap, or Bootstrap jQuery, Ember, Handlebars, all those things, and then you have a application.js, which is the name of it. So in this case, I called my demo, so you get a demo of that JS. 
And then if you have any style sheets in the style folder, those get compiled into a vendor and a demo CSS as well. Okay? And in your build, you can tell it what stuff to pull in and not for which environment. Like you have control over all that. But yeah, ultimately, at the bare, bare, bare minimum, you're going to have three files. Index.html, a vendor.js, and your application.js. And then again, if you have images, you, know, you can add to that. That's the bare uh, so takeaways, architecture and your applications are dictated by your browser templates. Controllers are like decorators for your models. Routes are more like your traditional controllers in an application. Uh, think long and hard before putting actions in your controllers, okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, instead, put them on the lowest shareable route, but there's exceptions to every rule. Uh, some resources, Ember.js has got some guides. Uh, they've also got a cookbook out there. To discuss Ember.js is a great site uh, to have conversations about Ember. And then that's where the Ember Inspector is at which I can show you for 15 seconds, uh, and then we are finished. So here, if I go to this Ember tab, this will actually show you, like, here's all of the routes that are registered in this application. Uh, this You're is, yeah, So, uh, so these are our routes. Uh, we have the index route, we have the application route, Products route, card route, you got these two for free, the loading and error, we can talk about them, but you get the idea of what to do. Um, we don't have any data, but if we were tied into like Ember data, you could then actually look at your actual models and all that kind of stuff, we just do it that way. Uh, your view tree, so I can look at, but here, I can tell which template's doing what, and it's actually using the controller, it's bound by what things, it's, it's, it's immensely helpful when you're 20 levels deep into an application, you're like, I'm really not sure why I'm not getting the data I'm expecting to get here. You can come up here and be like, oh, because I don't have a controller on me, I thought I had. Oops, <laughs> really easy. Um, and nothing that we have built into here, uh, you can actually look at the promises and inspect them. You don't get a lot of it out of this application, but if you start talking about JSON calls and stuff, you can actually walk inside, look at them. The Ember Inspector is an awesome, awesome tool to help you debug and build your Ember applications, and also just to get used to them. Go to another website that's written Ember, pull this up, and just see how they have it organized. You're not looking at the code, but you're looking at the structure of the application. So Ember Inspector is awesome. And uh, that now is the Thank you. Awesome. Great job.